Hello, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us for day two of the Engaged and Commit to Connect Social Engagement Virtual Summit. My name is Meredith Hanley. I'm the Director of Community Capacity Building at US Aging, and I serve as Director of both Engaged and the Commit to Connect Initiatives Coordinating Center. I'll be serving as the moderator for the Social Engagement Virtual Summit. As we shared yesterday, U.S. Aging has the privilege of administering Engaged, the National Resource Center for Engaging Older Adults, and serving as the Coordinating Center for Commit to Connect, both of which are funded by the Administration for Community Living. Engaged and Commit to Connect focus on promoting social engagement and addressing social isolation and loneliness with their own unique aims and activities, and both programs have teamed up to co-host the Social Engagement Virtual Summit. It was our pleasure yesterday to include a brief video from the Surgeon General of the United States, Dr. Vivek Morthy, which is available on the Virtual Summit webpage for you to view at any time, and we'll place a link to that in the chat. Today, we'll be focusing on supporting the social connectedness of family caregivers of older adults and people with disabilities. Tips for communi communicating with impact will also be shared. Before we move into our agenda, I want to give Katie Clark, policy analyst with the Administration for Community Living, a few minutes to share her welcoming remarks. Katie? Thank you, Meredith. And thank you to our speakers, panelists, and attendees for attending today and your commitment and interest in increasing social isolation or increasing social connection and engagement across the US. I welcome you to the second and final day of the Engaged and Commit to Connect Social Engagement Virtual Summit. The Administration for Community Living aims to maximize the independence, well being, and health of older adults, people with disabilities across the lifespan, and their families and caregivers. ACL was created around the fundamental principle that older adults and people of all ages with disabilities should be able to live where they choose, with the people they choose, and with the ability to participate fully in their communities. Social engagement and connection is crucial to this mission. Connecting with others is essential to our health, our well-being, and quality of life. Today, we will focus on supporting family caregivers including diverse family caregivers, and how organizations can increase outreach, build partnerships, and strengthen strategic services to help family caregivers of older adults and people with disabilities engage with their community. As a former family caregiver myself, I still remember the isolation and loneliness I felt and the impact it had on my ability to give care. It is crucial we remember our family caregivers as we develop and address social isolation in the populations we serve. Today, we will hear from Allison Barkoff, Acting Administrator at ACL and the Assistant Secretary for Aging, who will highlight ACL's commitment and work to support family caregivers in promoting social connectedness among older adults and people with disabilities. I will later represent Commit to Connect an ACL cross-sector initiative to spotlight resources and tools to support local, state, and national organizations' social engagement work. We will also spotlight the OASIS Institute on the Community Care Corps initiative on their Caregiver Respite and Support Program. We will also get the chance to hear from a panel on the barriers to engagement that family caregivers face and how organizations can develop programs activities and outreach practices that support their family, their social engagement. And finally, we will learn tips on how to communicate strategically to reach potential participants with social engagement opportunities and demonstrate program impact to funders and key stakeholders. Thank you again, everyone, and I really look forward to today. Uh, Meredith, go ahead and she will share some housekeeping tips. Absolutely. Uh, thank you, Katie. So for those of you who were not on the summit yesterday or could perhaps benefit from a couple reminders, I'll share a few housekeeping notes on how you can engage and participate in the summit today. 
All attendees are in listen only mode. So to ask questions of our speakers, you can use the Zoom question and answer or Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. There will be time at the end of each of the sections of today's summit to address attendees questions. And we certainly encourage your questions since that helps us to tailor the content to your particular interests. There is also the chat feature where you can engage with the hundreds of colleagues joining you on the summit. Um, I see some of you are engaging in the chat already, which is fantastic. If you need tech technical support, you can use the chat feature to message us as the host directly, and we'll do our best to help you. You can also notify us that you'd like assistance by raising your virtual hand in Zoom. And you can also use the Zoom platform to, to raise or lower your hand by pressing the Alt plus Y button on, on your keyboard. Both American Sign Language and Communication Access Real-Time Translation or CART captioning services are being provided on the virtual summit. As you have likely observed, the video stream of an ASL interpreter will be spotlighted so attendees can view the interpreters throughout the summit. To access a live transcription of the event, click on the CC or Show Captions button in the control bar at the bottom of your Zoom window, or you can click on the URL that is provided in the chat to open the captioning in a new window. For those who are using a screen reader and perhaps wish to silence unwanted chatter in the chat or Q&A boxes, you can activate the Speech on Demand feature by pressing Insert, Spacebar, and then pressing the letter S on the keyboard. Uh, we are recording this summit and recordings will be posted on the Engaged and Commit to Connect websites within the next few days. I'm now going to transition to a video with US Aging CEO Sandy Markwood, who will be introducing our keynote speaker. Please remember to turn your audio up if the audio is low on your end. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the second day of the Engaged and Commit to Connect Social Engagement Virtual Summit. I am thrilled to introduce our keynote speaker for today, Allison Barkoff, who is a true champion for people with disabilities, older adults, and family caregivers. Allison was sworn in as the Principal Deputy Administrator on January 20th, 2021 and is currently serving as ACL's Acting Administrator and the Acting Assistant Secretary for Aging. In this capacity, she provides executive leadership and also coordination for ACL's programs nationwide and serves as an advisor to HHS Secretary Becerra on issues that impact people with disabilities and older adults. Allison is a lifelong advocate for community living, both professionally and personally. She is a sibling of an adult brother with developmental disabilities and worked alongside her brother and parents from an early age to advocate for disability rights in her home state and later across the country. Allison, thank you so much for being with us today to highlight ACL's leadership in supporting family caregivers and promoting social connectedness among older adults and people with disabilities. I'll now turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Sandy, for the introduction. And it's really a pleasure to speak with all of you about this important topic. First, let me applaud the work being done by both engage and commit to connect. ACL has been a strong supporter of social engagement for older adults and people with disabilities since our founding as an agency, and your work is making our goals a reality. I know there have been other efforts, such as ACL's nutrition program, which has always used meals as a way of forging social connections and helping people access a wide variety of resources. But the need in our communities is still great. Too many people with disabilities and older adults feel lonely, and we know there are ways we can help them achieve the social connections they desire. Achieving social connections often requires a prolonged commitment and a system that includes one-on-one -on -one connections or having a facility and meals and transportation. But with funding, 
the right people and the right strategies, it is possible. Throughout the COVID pandemic, we saw many older adults and people with disabilities become socially isolated. And we worked with our partners to highlight successful strategies to improve social engagement. Even at the height of the pandemic, when face-to-face -face contact was life-threatening, we saw creative solutions, such as porch visits and daily check-in calls as part of friendly caller programs. I'm sure many of you listening today were engaged in those efforts and are dedicated to making sure social engagement stays front and center as a priority. That's what community living is all about, our interactions with each other, our support of one another. So thank you for all you have done and all you are continuing to do. Because of you, our communities are not only better, they are stronger. Today, I also wanna talk about a topic that does not get as much attention as it should. And that's the fact that family caregivers of all ages can themselves become socially isolated. Let me drop back for a minute and tell you a little bit about who caregivers are. The truth is they are all of us. Rosalind Carter famously said that the world has only four kinds of people those who have been caregivers, those who are currently caregivers, those who will be caregivers, and those who are supported by caregivers. As ACL's Acting Administrator and Assistant Secretary for Aging, I hear about the important role that caregivers play in our communities literally every day. And that's why I was so honored to be part last year of our delivery of the nation's first national strategy to support family caregivers to Congress and to the public. That strategy was the result of an incredible effort ACL coordinated by working with the Ray's Family Caregiving Advisory Council and the Advisory Council to support grandparents raising grandchildren. These two councils worked with 15 federal agencies which together committed to take an astounding 345 actions to advance and support family caregivers. This first of its kind document, one that so many voices have long called for, is a vision for how the nation will move forward in supporting family caregivers. Although the 2022 national strategy has been delivered, the work is far from done. In fact, it's just beginning. The councils will continue their work to see that the strategy is implemented and that family caregivers actually receive the support that they need. And we've already made a lot of progress because we have shown a spotlight on the issues family caregivers face. Many of you may have heard President Biden speaking in the Rose Garden on April 18th as he signed an executive order on caregiving. It was truly monumental. And I was lucky enough to be there in person alongside many from the aging and disability and caregiving communities to see him sign an order that issues more than 50 directives to federal agencies to further our work together and the needs of older adults, people with disabilities and caregivers. Issues such as the role of professional direct care workers play in providing support and all of the support that family caregivers provide. At ACL, we proudly support the Lifespan Respite Care Program, community-based respite care services for family caregivers of children and adults of all ages with disabilities and chronic conditions. We also recognize the importance of helping caregivers understand how critical it is to use a person-centered approach because caregiving is about supporting the person and helping the person achieve what it is they want in their lives. That can be very rewarding. And we have heard so many caregivers talk positively about the fact that it is truly an honor to serve as a caregiver but caregiving does take time and it often comes at great financial cost. 
In fact, the national strategy explains that the nation's 53 million caregivers experience a staggering $522 billion in lost wages every year. Caregiving can also take a physical toll and result in increased levels of stress, depression, and social isolation for caregivers. And unfortunately, there is not enough available in the way of education, counseling, and peer support specifically designed for family and other informal caregivers such as friends. In fact, many family caregivers don't even see themselves as caregivers. They think of themselves as husband, wife, brother, sister, son, daughter, niece, nephew, grandchild, or whatever the relationship is. Their role may grow as caregiver, growing over time, just as it might diminish over time. Some people become caregivers early in their life and some later. Every caregiver, of course, is unique, but each person who is a caregiver needs social engagement. And today, I'm advocating for that need. Everyone who is listening today has a deep commitment to social connection. You are here because you know how powerful it can be to maintain connections. As we engage with older adults and people with disabilities to support their social connections, I'm asking that we also spend time considering the social connections their caregivers need. Maybe it's about making sure the caregiver has respite support so they can not only do their chores, but also connect with friends and family. Or about helping make sure they have access to communication technology and know how to use it so they can have video chats or join Zoom calls with friends and family or community groups. The important thing is that we make sure caregivers are part of the social connection agenda. And if you haven't read the 2022 National Strategy to Support Family Caregivers, please visit acl.gov and read it. Thank you again for all you are doing to support social connection and engagement, and thank you for listening in today. Allison, thank you so much for ACL's leadership in the social engagement space and also for recognizing the importance of combating the social isolation of caregivers as we build out our social engagement strategies. Can you talk just for a few moments about the ways that the disability and aging communities can work together to promote social engagement? We have such a wonderful captured audience here of committed champions, and we would welcome your remarks and your guidance in that regard. Thank you, Sandy, so much. It's such an important question. I think anyone who has ever heard me talk or spent any time with me knows that I really believe in the force multiplier that our networks can be when they work together. And really that's the reason ACL was formed in 2012 because leaders in the disability and aging community recognized the commonality about how important community living is both to older adults and to people with disabilities and really recognize the power that comes from us all working together towards these shared goals. And so 11 years later, we've really seen that vision come to fruition. And we still have work to do to, to bring our communities together, but we've seen so much progress. So social connections and social engagement are so important for everyone. And unfortunately, social isolation is far too common both for people with disabilities and older adults. Now, as I said, at the height of COVID, we saw so many organizations and agencies elevating their work on social engagement, and we saw it both across the disability and aging community. I think we've talked about it a lot more in the aging community, but COVID really put a light on how people with disabilities have a similar experience of social engagement. I am so proud of our network of 20,000 community-based organizations across aging and disability. And we truly, truly make more of a difference when we can work together. 
it's the case of the whole is more than the sum of the parts and we can leverage shared resources and ideas and synergies whether that's things like joint applications or sharing facilities or even bringing people together of all ages is just such a promising practice and something that I hope we can lift up because solving big problems requires partnership. So I'd really ask anyone who's participating around social engagement, uh, around older adults, reach out, seek your colleagues in the disability community, connect and talk about ideas. And the same thing to our colleagues participating in the disability community reach out to the aging colleagues and really find some ways to work together because we are all in this together and we can really make a difference by our collaboration. Allison, thank you. And, and, and I want to reinforce your comment about we are stronger together. We can do more together working across the aging and disability communities and in our communities in general. Thank you so much for spotlighting ACL's leadership in this space and your leadership in this space. We are so appreciative of you taking the time to participate in the Social Engagement Virtual Summit and sharing your perspectives from the Administration for Community Living on the critical importance of promoting social engagement of older adults, people with disabilities, and their important caregivers. Again, thank you so much. Thank you, Sandy. Hello, everyone. We are thrilled that Allison Barkov was able to share more about the Administration for Community Living's important work to support family caregivers. We so appreciate ACL's leadership in this space. As we shared earlier in the opening remarks, Commit to Connect is focused on promoting social engagement and addressing social isolation and loneliness. Specifically, Commit to Connect focuses on developing resources for the aging and disability networks and is growing a nationwide network of champions aimed at addressing social isolation and loneliness at the local, state, and national levels. To ensure that all of you are aware how Commit Connect can support your organization's social engagement work, Katie Clark will be spotlighting resources and tools from Commit to Connect. So Katie, I will hand it to you. Thank you again, Meredith. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you again for joining us today. Um, my name is Katie Clark, and I work for the Administration for Community Living in the Center for Innovation for Partnership. And I lead the Commit to Connect initiative, which is ACL's cross-sector initiative launched by ACL to fight social isolation and loneliness by helping people connect and engage to build the social connections they need to thrive. As I stated before, connecting with others is essential to health, well-being, and quality of life. And we are honored to be engaged in this work. Allie, you can go to the next slide. Commit to Connect was established during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, when we really saw the need to address social isolation and loneliness in all populations, but especially older and aging adults, people with disabilities, and caregivers. We established Commit to Connect through partnerships um, across the federal government and with private partners um, to engage with local, state, and national leaders to improve the social infrastructure to address this critical issue. The aim of the Commit to Connect initiative is to connect people with people living with isolation with programs and resources to help them find social connection and engagement and thrive in community living. Now, Commit to Connect has a twofold strategy. We work to increase the awareness and the availability of programs and strategies that address social isolation and loneliness and grow social connections. But we also build and strengthen the collaboration with current and potential partners to leverage our collective efforts, our resources, innovations, and activities to increase social connections across the US. Oh, you can go to the next slide. Listed here are some of our key efforts. Really, our key efforts are to deepen knowledge 
strengthen social infrastructure in local communities, mobilize health sectors, and encourage pro-connection public policies and create a culture of connection. We do this through cultivating a nationwide network of champions who are committed to addressing social isolation and loneliness. We also have online discussions, resource sharings on our virtual hub. We hold communities of practice and webinars and peer-to-peer -peer exchanges to build capacity, share innovation, and engage our stakeholders in peer networking and opportunities to connect. The Commit to Connect initiative is guided by an advisory committee, which represents a variety of perspectives and reflects how we are a cross-sector initiative. These partners provide critical insight and input that help shape Connect to Connect. Um, in addition to these partners, we are also guided by a scientific advisory group, which informs our evidence-based practice strategy um, and how we are working to lift up innovation across the U.S. We also have a nationwide network of champions, which is what we call our free virtual community and hub. This is a virtual hub of leaders and innovators at local, state, and national levels. This space is an opportunity to connect, to stay informed, and to collaborate. You can engage in discussions, share research, um, share tools and events, while also identifying those across the platform. We have members representing local, state, and federal governments, but really across sectors, including academia, healthcare, caregiving, nonprofit, and even private sector companies. The activities across the nationwide network of champions aim to strengthen social infrastructure and increase the capacity of our partners to better understand and address social isolation and loneliness. We also have private and open communities or forums on different topics, um, but also for our communities to practice. As a, part of, as a part of the Nationwide Network of Champions, you are a member of a group with passionate leaders and innovators at all levels across the United States. Examples of champions include staff, volunteers from community-based organizations, local foundations, philanthropic organizations, educational groups, senior centers, parks and recreation, respite providers, centers for independent living, and a variety of community-based organizations. Here is a screenshot of our nationwide network of champions. Again, this is our virtual community and hub. I really encourage you all to check it out and become a member if you not, are not already. A lot of the great connections and resource sharing and networking that is happening in the chat during this summit can continue and there's space for that on this hub. So I really encourage you all to take advantage of this free platform um, and opportunity to connect with leaders across the US. And as you can see here, as of this spring 2023, we have grown to 266 active members with an additional 238 organizations represented. So we have folks from all over the US that are engaged in conversation, sharing resources and tools, events, and asking questions of each other, um, all in the space of social connection and engagement. You are able to access a directory of members, um, contact them, and really engage in some strong capacity building through peer net networking. And joining the Nationwide Network of Champions is pretty straightforward. We do have a very, very brief application process just to ensure folks in the space are um, who they say they are you will complete um, a registration form and submit it. It's just a page long, just identifying who you are, your role and what you're interested in. Um, you will receive an email that confirms receipt of that application. 
And once we review that application, you will receive an email with access to our online network hub. And again, this is a completely free resource um, and is really open to anyone who is interested and engaged in this space. Commit to Connect also maintains a website that is full of resources, both for consumers and for professionals. Um, and this is also a home where we have information on all of our upcoming events. I really encourage you to check out the professional resource section in the consumer resource section. You can also sign up for our newsletter on the website, which we send out bi-monthly, um, which will share our upcoming events and webinars and resources, which could include topical guides, peer-to-peer uh, -peer exchanges, future communities of practice, um, and webinars. So thank you all so much for taking the time to learn about this work. Um, really, the strength of the initiative is based on the membership of those folks in the Nationwide Network of Champions and the level of commitment that you all bring to this work. So I really appreciate it um, and value you all showing up here today and supporting this effort um, and look forward to seeing you engage in the chat and on the Nationwide Network of Champions to share your resources, your questions, um, and to engage with each other. Thank you so much, Meredith. Great. Uh, thanks, Katie. So while Katie was speaking, I did place links to the Commit to Connect website and uh, a link to the Nationwide Network of Champions or a page that'll take you to that, that kind of simple and straightforward uh, registration page. So if you're interested in checking out the website or joining the Nationwide Network of Champions, and we hope you are, of course, uh, just check out the, the chat for those easy links. Um, so I think we will we will pivot to some questions. I believe we have a, a few minutes for questions, so please keep them coming in, in the Q&A box at the bottom of your uh, Zoom module. But we do have a, a, a few that we've received so far. So um, one was kind of in the realm of evidence-based programming. Folks are interested in continuing to have support in developing evidence-based programs. And Katie, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how that's a focus of Commit to Connect to help to grow the evidence-based programs within the realm of um, social isolation and loneliness. Sure, thank you, Meredith. And this is a huge area of interest for I think a lot of people that we work with in organizations. Um, I think, you know, as new tools and skills emerge, we wanna make sure that they are person-centered um, and also measuring what we uh, need to measure when understanding social connection and engagement. So in addition to identifying research and key resources, which we list on the website, um, which is public facing, we also try and identify interesting and innovative work. Um, one example of that is our upcoming community of practice, which we are launching in May. Uh, we are partnering with subject matter experts in the field of monitoring and evaluation who have experience in developing scales and tools to measure change over time with social isolation and loneliness to see if interventions are um, making a difference in, in the impact that they're having. So through this community of practice, we've invited three network um, organizations or agencies that are already implementing uh, interventions or programs related to social connection and engagement. And we're giving them access to this tool um, and scale to measure that change over time to see if their interventions are meaningful. Um, and doing that through a learning collaborative, I think provides the opportunity for learning um, and also for us to help them understand the data and apply it in a meaningful way. Um, this is our first community practice focused on monitoring and evaluation, but we really see this as a valuable way to interact with our network and hope to continue to do similar opportunities. Excellent. Um, thank you. Okay, questions are really rolling in. So um, uh, another question was just about the kind of intersections between aging and disability. And Katie, I thought this might be an opportunity to talk about kind of the, the population focus of Commit to Connect, um, 
kind of the, the aims with regard to reaching both the aging and disability networks as well as perhaps broader audiences. So could you speak to, to I guess, the overall aims and um, tar target populations of Commit to Connect? Absolutely. Um, so Commit to Connect really uh, focuses on all populations, but trying to uh, pay most closely attention to aging and older adults, people with disabilities, and their caregivers. Um, we see these as the populations that ACL supports and populations that have specific needs related to social isolation and loneliness. Um, you know, I really stand by remarks made by Allison Barkoff earlier that we get a lot of strength and opportunity from working together and collaborating. And we know that caregivers and people with disabilities exist across the lifespan. So we really are looking to identify innovation and build, bolster up the capacity of those in our networks um, across populations because we believe that we have a lot to learn from each other um, and really uh, try to create opportunities to do this. Um, I think after COVID-19, there was an incredible surge in interest and resources for social isolation and loneliness and Commit to Connect is really trying to build off of that momentum. Super, thank you so much. Um, there was a question about becoming a champion. So when you become a champion, are there ways to connect with other specific organizations? So, and this person had a particular interest in um, connecting with others in rural areas as an example, but kind of like as you become a champion, how do you connect with others? So maybe just a little bit of an explanation of the hub and how people can connect through that. Absolutely. Um, so once you enter the hub, you're able to access a directory um, with everyone's information, name, and organization they represent. Um, and you're able to reach out, them, out to them directly. Um, you're able to search keywords um, and maybe find someone by searching in rural. We also have um, a fair amount of community space and discussion boards where you can post questions, create your own community, um, and try and reach out to folks um, who may have shared interests. Um, I know that that's a huge topic um, and really there probably is a lot of people that hope to connect over that. Uh, Commit to Connect also tries to create opportunities for members to engage with each other. Um, we have been hosting peer-to-peer -peer exchanges, which are very informal spaces over video um, to come together and discuss ideas, post questions, um, and come up with solutions as a group. Um, our last peer-to-peer -peer networking event, we had, I think, around 50 people. We capped it so that we could have strong you know, discussion, and we focused the conversation on outreach. Um, because of that topic, rural populations were certainly one that uh, we, we focused a lot of time on. And I would think that would also be a really uh, helpful way to connect with others and to even kind of come up with solutions together. Excellent. So I think there's a, a, a good amount of interest in the community of practice that you had described or a couple questions, but I think I'll just focus on one. Somebody was interested in how they can be part of a future community of practice. Yeah, I'm so glad to hear there's interest. Uh, we are really excited about this opportunity and hope to continue to, to do similar things. I recommend becoming, um, becoming a champion and also signing up for our newsletter. That is the best way to receive opportunities, events, um, become engaged in webinars, um, but we will be keeping you updated with our experience with this community of practice um, but also opportunities to join future communities of practice through the web, through the newsletter. And on that note, if there is just one resource that you want to make sure folks um, check out as a result of your remarks here today on Commit to Connect, is there one that you would make sure that they, a, 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 an absolute like can't miss resource, what would you point people to? Wow, that's tough, but I'm going to say our <laughs> of champions. I think it's just such a unique space um, and it is what we you make of it. Um, you are the folks that are population facing, maybe doing the research in university studying this. Um, 
And there's just a wealth of knowledge that exists across the U.S. based on experiences. Um, and I think, you know, I can do my best to position you all to learn from each other. Um, and that space is really allows a lot of opportunity for that. So I really encourage you to, to check it out and become a member. Again, I've loved seeing the chat. There's just so much connection happening in the chat and people are sharing resources and emails. These are all things that are already happening on our hub and that I hope that you're able to continue to do. Mm. Yeah, that is such a great point. I think it's so exciting when we see these chats get so active in our webinars or, of course, in the virtual summit both yesterday and today. And we'd love to keep that momentum forward and, you know, encourage more membership on, on the hub where you can continue this dialogue with each other. But thank you, Katie, for your presentation and, and for those um, um, responses to the many questions that we got into the Q&A box. So we'll pivot to the next section of the agenda. With the earlier framer from Allison Barkov, the, the acting administrator of the Administration for Community Living on the importance of supporting the social connection of family caregivers, we will now dive into a program spotlight from Community Care Corps. Sarah Page, who serves as the Community Care Corps Project Manager at the OASIS Institute, will first provide an overview of the initiative and how it supports family caregivers. And we'll also be joined by Beth Wiggins, Director of Caregiving and Aging Services at Family Means, which is a Community Care Corps grantee. And Beth will highlight her organization's Family Caregiver Respite and Support Program. So we thank you both for being here. And Sarah, I will turn it to you to kick this section of the agenda off. Sarah. Thank you, Meredith. Uh, as uh, Meredith said, my name is Sarah Page and I am the project manager for Community Care Corps. I'm here at the Oasis Institute in St. Louis, Missouri. I want to give you all a little bit of advanced warning. Uh, I do work remotely and we do have two two-year-old beagles. So if any of you are familiar with beagles, then you know they can be very vocal. So I apologize in advance if somebody should decide to take a walk in front of my house or if a neighbor dog should bark or a rabbit or a squirrel run across the back door. Um, and to make things a little bit more fun, our backyard neighbor decided to take today to have their large tree in the backyard taken down. So you might also hear some chainsaws. So um, hopefully they won't hit my cable line. Um, next slide, please. So some of you may have heard about Community Care Corps, um, but for those of you who haven't, Community Care Corps is a national federally funded grant program that funds innovative local models to provide non-medical volunteer assistance to family caregivers, older adults, and adults with disabilities to maintain their independence in the community. Next slide. Back in September of 2019, the Administration for Community Living awarded a cooperative agreement to the team of Oasis Institute, Caregiver Action Network, U.S. Aging, and Altarum to launch Community Care Corps. Our goal is to increase the number of volunteer programs across the country and to learn what components of each model work best. Then others who are wanting to develop a volunteer model have the information they need to design, write, size, and implement a program that meets the needs of their specific community. Next slide, please. To date, Community Care Corps has awarded nearly $8 million to 79 organizations who across the country have assisted over 4,000 caregivers and 22,000 care recipients with more than 8,000 volunteers. The target population receiving non-medical volunteer assistance must include at least one of these three groups, family caregivers, older adults, and adults with disabilities. Older adults must be at least 60 years of age. Adults with disabilities must be age 18 or over, and both must have difficulty living independently and require assistance with instrumental activities of daily living. Family caregivers are adult family members who um, or, well, or other unpaid individuals who provide assistance to an individual with a chronic or other health condition, disability, or functional limitation. The volunteers recruited to assist these target populations vary from organization to organization. The only limitation is that all volunteers must be age 18 and pass a criminal background check. Next slide, please. 
So just in case you were wondering what I mean by non-medical volunteer assistance, I have a slide for that. Uh, the types of non-medical assistance that volunteers offer to the three target populations vary from grantee to grantee. And you can see some examples here on that slide. <clears throat> As Allison mentioned earlier, um, social isolation is definitely a problem, and we have a lot of models offering companionship and friendly visiting to our care recipients. And as we know, all uh, that adults age 65 and older are at risk for loneliness and social isolation due to the increased likelihood of living alone, um, loss of their social network, illness, and hearing loss. According to the National Institute on Aging, individuals experiencing social isolation and loneliness are at increased risk for high blood pressure, heart disease, obesity, a weakened immune system, anxiety, depression, cognitive decline, Alzheimer's disease, and sadly, even death. Caregivers experience loneliness and social isolation as well. Per the Family Caregiver Alliance, 40 to 70% of family caregivers experience symptoms of depression with both emotional and physical implications brought on by loneliness and social isolation related to being a caregiver. Often the assistance provided by Community Care Corps volunteers is directed to the care recipient, not the caregiver. So that would be the older adult or the adult with the disability. However, the family caregiver indirectly benefits as well from that assistance. So let's, let's take an example. <clears throat> let's say Mrs. Smith lives with her daughter and her young granddaughter. Um, they have a college age volunteer who comes in once a week for three hours to visit with Mrs. Smith. Mrs. Smith shares stories and experiences with the volunteer and they participate in activities that Mrs. Smith enjoys like playing cards and listening to music. Um, but when the volunteer leaves, Mrs. Smith is always such a, in a good mood and so happy. This gives Mrs. Smith's daughter and granddaughter an opportunity for some one-on-one -on -one time that they don't necessarily get to enjoy otherwise. And in the evening, Mrs. Smith has something to share with her family about what she did with the volunteer. So even though the students there directly to see Mrs. Mrs. Smith, the entire family gets to benefit from that. Next slide, please. I also wanted to share with you some key findings from the pre and post surveys that have been completed by the family care caregivers participating in Community Care Corps. Let's start with some demographic information. Most of the care corps, uh, I'm sorry, most of the caregivers who have received Community Care Corps um, assistance that were surveyed are over the age of 65, retired, women, and people of color who are supporting either a spouse or a parent. Nearly three out of four caregivers provide daily supports as well to care recipients for non-medical tasks, such as transportation, shopping, financial management, meal preparation, technical assistance, uh, housekeeping, management of their medications, and also laundry. These tasks are often in addition to any personal care activities the family member may need assist with or even medical assistance, such as managing, for example, their blood pressure, uh, managing their blood sugar, oxygen levels, and possibly even some wound care. If volunteers could provide assistance with some of these non-medical tasks that are noted on, here on the slide, it would greatly support those family caregivers. Next slide, please. So as I stated before, Community Care Corps focuses on both the direct and the indirect benefits that those caregivers receive. Again, those indirect benefits are those benefits the caregiver receives because of assistance that is provided directly to their care recipient. The most beneficial indirect supports that caregivers uh, report um, would be things like general supports and resources, opportunities for free time, help around the house, running errands. As for the direct benefit, Overall, the caregiver assessment of their volunteer assistants were overwhelmingly positive. They reported that the volunteers were very well trained, they were friendly, and they, the caregiver, were very satisfied with the assistance that they received. 
87% of caregivers said they would like to continue receiving volunteer assistance. And one of the most important outcomes noted was that the caregivers perceived health and quality of life remain stable while they receive non-medical volunteer assistance, meaning that overall, their perceived health and quality of life did not decline while receiving volunteer assistance. Next slide, please. One last thing I'd like to touch on before Beth speaks about their amazing program at Family Means is that Community Care Corps posted a new RFP on Monday, May 8th on the Community Care Corps website, communitycarecorps.org. If you're interested in developing or enhancing or growing a volunteer program, I highly encourage you to check it out. Applicants have the opportunity to choose from one of two options for funding this cycle. Option one is our standard Community Care Corps model. Funds will be awarded to local organizations across the country to establish, enhance, or grow model volunteer programs in home or community-based settings with volunteers performing non-medical tasks and providing assistance to older adults, adults with disabilities, and supporting family caregivers. Option two is new to Community Care Corps this year, and funds will be awarded to local organizations across the country to provide volunteer chaperone assistance to accompany older adults and adults with disabilities in need to and from non-emergency medical appointments and outpatient procedures. They will deliver services door through door such that they are addressing care recipient expectations and needs before and after those non-emergency appointments and procedures. You can view the RFP now. Uh, the portal for application submission won't open until May 22nd, but it will remain open through June, July 7th. The grant cycle will run 18 months beginning October 1st of 2023 and ending March 31st of 2025. Applicants will be allowed to request between $30,000 and $200,000 and will have a 20% match requirement. Next slide, please. So thank you for coming today to learn about volunteers across, across the country are supporting family caregivers and their care recipients. If you have any questions about Community Care Corps, you can check out our website, communitycarecorps.org, or contact me at info at communitycarecorps.org. So now I would like to pass the program over to Beth Wiggins with Family Means. Thank you, Sarah. It's so good to see you in this setting, and it's great to be with all of you to tell you about how Family Means <clears throat> is helping family caregivers be socially engaged. Family Means is a multi-service organization in Minnesota, in kind of the suburban area of the Minneapolis-St. Paul metropolitan area, and I'm the Director of Caregiving and Aging at Family Means. And I'm going to start with the most obvious one, which is simply respite giving family caregivers, family and friend caregivers, the time and freedom to be socially engaged. And of course, respite is necessary, necessary along the whole continuum of caregiving trajectory from the beginning to the end. And over the years, Family Means has developed quite a spectrum of respite options that caregiving families tap into. We began in 1986 with our caregiver support by providing in-home respite um, care provided by volunteers, and we still do that. Volunteers who are trained and supervised to provide up to four hours once a week of in-home companionship and supervision. And this is good for people who are still doing pretty well, um, but can't be left alone for some reason, all the way up to people at the end of life. Caregivers, of course, use that time to be free to engage in other aspects of their lives. Um, however they choose. They might want to go shopping unencumbered by the person that they're caring for. Maybe they do some volunteering themselves or take a class, have a lunch date with a friend, go to the gym, maybe attend one of our support groups. Years later, we started a group respite program. Um, it's a social model group respite that's heavily reliant on volunteers for people who are physically able to leave their homes and manage their personal needs independently. So they're able to manage in the bathroom and feed themselves and that kind of thing. But they may have pretty significant cognitive difficulties. 
So in the group setting, they play games, have music experiences and art projects, have lunch together, and really enjoy the energy of a, of a group setting. The caregivers use that time in similar ways to our in-home respite caregiving clients, um, but they also really appreciate the knowledge that their person is being socially engaged. I want to read a quote um, to you from one of our caregivers who participates, her, her husband participates in our day out program. Day out is the name of that weekly group respite service. She says, this has been life changing for Tom. This has broadened his world and it's so nice to see him engaged with others. He looks forward to coming every Friday. He so enjoys the chance to socialize with others and enjoys the entire morning. He is energetic and so talkative for the remainder of the day. And just as an aside, I want to point out that this was in answer to a question to the caregiver about what the caregiver likes about getting respite. And of course, this caregiver went immediately to what the person she cares for likes about the experience, which is very typical. This is even true for um, virtual group respite, which is something that emerged during the pandemic. We started a an online version of our group respite. Um, and one of those caregivers, we still do it uh, once a week for a very small group of people. And one of those caregivers says, I think virtual day out is working perfectly. My husband as a homebound adult is very isolated. The program gives him a chance to connect with others, something he wouldn't have without it. Knowing my husband, I'm frankly surprised, but pleased to see the pleasure he gets from meeting with the group. He's not one to use or like electronic communication, but this program has grabbed him in a good way. Although I'm always home when you meet together, I don't pay much attention to the specific content. It's when I hear happy trails, which is how we end each session, that I come running to shut down my laptop. With the help of Community Care Corps, we were really able to revitalize both of um, those kinds of respite after the pandemic, where we had a, a major pause in much of that, but we also added an evening option. So once a month, we have an evening group respite service um, that's modeled along the same lines as day out. And I think there, there will be, or there has been a, a link put in the chat to a video that kind of gives you a, a more detailed outline of how we, um, how those things evolved for family needs over the years. In more recent years, we realized there's a gap for families who are early in the progression of dementia. There really was nothing appropriate for them and absolutely no reason that their worlds need to contract at that point. They're still wanting to learn new things, have new experiences, experiment, visit places of interest and give back to the community, but they need someone to curate those experiences and provide the right amount of adaptation and support. And their caregivers are tired, just like caregivers in later stages are tired um, of being that planner and that kind of curator. So we developed something we call Community Connection, which is a six-week series of sessions, and we do about seven of these six-week sessions each year, during which people in early stages of dementia come together around a theme. There's usually a guest expert that might be a teaching artist or a naturalist or a historian. Um, some sessions take place off-site at a museum, maybe, or a nature conservancy or an art gallery, um, and some at our location, which offers the best of social engagement for the participants. They're developing peer relationships and making new friends. They're getting acquainted with community organizations in a way that allows them to be the one in the know, the person with dementia, um, and they can then introduce that location or that activity to other family members or friends. Um, and sometimes we're even volunteering with them or they're volunteering with us maybe is another way to put it. And the sense of accomplishment and meaningful contribution that comes from that kind of activity. It also improves the dementia friendliness of the community. We provide dementia friendly training to the staff of the partner sites we use. Um, and the presence of our group there gives those organizations opportunities to interact and learn from people with dementia. And our hope is that over time, this will make social engagement easier for everybody, whether they're participants in our program or not. But we've also learned recently that caregivers don't want to be left out. They can and do spend their 
their respite time taking a break, but we found that they often would gather back here at our site a little bit early before it's time to pick up their person. Um, and they'd be chatting with each other, speculating about what the group had done that day and talking kind of wistfully about the field trips that, that maybe they were off on and wishing they could be there. So based on their feedback, we're now including the caregivers in one session of each six week series. So they can get a glimpse of what the participants have been experiencing or maybe take part in, in an outing. So a couple of examples of that, um, right in the dead of winter, and as I, as I said, we're in Minnesota, so winter is significant for us. The, the series was about warmth and heat. Um, and so one day they um, were learning about Hawaiian culture and there was a hula um, dancing troupe that came and taught them some hula, brought some Hawaiian instruments for them to, to use. Um, and then the event that the caregivers got to participate in was a trip to the winter flower show at an indoor conservatory. And so they got to breathe in the humid air and smell the flowers um, during our frigid February. A series that we just completed in April was all about stories. So we had a storyteller come um, and work with the group to elicit their personal memories and histories. We uh, visited and discussed the historical exhibits at a local heritage museum. And the thing that the caregivers participated in was the, the culminating week of that six weeks, um, a one act play about memory loss. And so the, the participants were there, the caregivers were there, and we invited community members as well to come to this play and then engage in a discussion afterwards. Before I wind up, I want to point out that it's not just respite, I believe, that plays a role in keeping caregivers socially engaged, but other kinds of caregiver supports can do that too. Obviously, respite gives them the time to do that, but think about support groups, for example. Um, as you all know, I'm sure caregiving is isolating and people can feel so very much alone in that experience until they meet others who are experiencing similar things. And then those peers become part of their support network and maybe their social engagement buddy in a sense. Coaching and consultation can help caregivers identify their own goals, which is usually quite a foreign concept to them. Um, it helps them give them permission to work toward meeting those goals, helps them find ways to feed their souls and strategize about how to make that happen. So again, by having some caregiver coaching and counseling, they can then be socially engaged. Even education can, um, can do the trick, gives people confidence, helps them learn skills and tap into resources that then allow, them for, allow for more social engagement for them. For example, let's say the topic of your education program is how to nurture important relationships while caregiving. That doesn't sound like it's about social engagement, but if it gets more people on their team, helps them learn how to release some of the guilt that might come from stepping away from caregiving for a bit, all of that opens doors for them for social engagement in whatever ways are most meaningful and helpful to them. And one more example of how we do this is through memory cafes, which are an opportunity for the person living with dementia and their caregiver to come together with others in similar circumstances um, for some social time, some learning in an environment that's very understanding because everybody knows what's happening. Um, we choose to do those in very public places as a, as a way of de-stigmatizing -stig dementia. So we have one in a library, one in a restaurant, one in a um, grocery store make them convenient for people. And again, it allows people to be out in the world doing regular things, um, but with a little extra care taken to make sure the experience feels welcoming and accepting. So I'll leave you with one final quote from a caregiver. This is somebody who um, with her husband has participated in memory cafes um, and, and her husband also comes to community connection. And she says, we're constantly looking for things to do together in the community. There's not a lot available for seniors like us. And sometimes we feel we are invisible. Coming to family means for the November event and hearing Margaret welcoming us by our names, it meant the world to us. We found a place that we belong. And that's what we're trying to do at Family Means is help people feel like they belong here, but also that they belong out in the world, out in the community. They're important, they're important to us. So I will 
close there. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah and Beth, for, for that fantastic highlight of your work. Um, just in case folks haven't been keeping an eye on the chat, while Sarah and Beth were speaking, we placed a link to the Community Care Corps Initiative in the chat, um, where you can also find the RFP document that Sarah mentioned. And there's also a link to Family family Means, and I think that YouTube video that was mentioned as well in the chat. So, um, so now we have a few minutes for some Q&A, so keep the questions coming. We do have a few already. And um, let's just let's just get that started. So I think this is a question that could go for either Sarah or Beth, but um, let me read it and we can decide who 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 wants to maybe take the the first um, response. but but with with p the pandemic, with Covid um, and just the impact of volunteerism, there was a question of, have you, Sarah, across the grantees or Beth within the program at your agency seen a drop in volunteerism? And kind of how did you work to address that? Have you um, done any new types of recruitment perhaps to address that? Is there one of you that would like to start with that question? Beth, do you Beth? want to go first? Sure, sure I can start. Um, that was actually one of the impetuses for us to um, apply to Community Care Corps because we really did kind of have to stop that in-person sort of respite and we needed some help in um, rebooting it. Um, and so what we've been doing besides re-engaging volunteers that we had before the pandemic, we have tried some new things. We've been recruiting um, volunteers from past clients. So once a caregiver is no longer a caregiver and they've had a chance to, to live as a former caregiver for a while and adjust to their loss, Sometimes they really want to give back. They remember what it was like and how important their respite volunteer was for them. So we have gotten a few respite volunteers that way. Um, we use all the, the, the um, online kind of volunteer clearing houses that I'm sure many of you are familiar with, are familiar with and use. Um, we're trying to break down barriers that some volunteers might encounter by providing gift cards and gas cards to reduce transportation costs, anything that we can do to just make it a little bit um, less burdensome perhaps, or again, alleviate a barrier that a volunteer might encounter. Sarah, would you like to add to that? Sure, yeah, the, the volunteerism when the pandemic started was really high. Everybody was so eager to give back to their community and a lot of people had been unfortunately furloughed or let, off, uh, let go of from their jobs. And so they had a lot more time. And then once, um, once they were starting to return to work or no longer working from home, the volunteers uh, started reducing um, older adults weren't able to volunteer because they were concerned about going into other people's homes or interacting with other people. Um, so yeah, volunteerism did significantly drop and, and it is um, not back to that level of, of the start of, pan, of the pandemic at, at this point in time either. Um, actually, um, word of mouth is the absolute best method that um, the grantees have talked about in regards to um, gathering other volunteers, um, having volunteers recruit other volunteers, um, using your volunteers as ambassadors for your program is also a really uh, important way to, to gather new volunteers. As Beth said, having some um, form of a, an incentive for them or um, uh, a reimbursement for them for the services they offer is terrific. Um, most of the time, uh, having having a an opportunity for them to once they state they're engaged to immediately start that onboarding process and then in, get them engaged quickly because if you delay that engagement process, you'll lose volunteers that way as well. So there's a lot of things to consider with recruiting volunteers. We've also had a lot of engagement with universities and colleges that are nearby and using a lot of those student volunteers, especially in the health professions. So there's a lot of um, ways to consider who to, to, who to reach out to and where to go. So use your social media, use your unearned media, um, and you know, 
sometimes earned media is okay too. Uh, the big thing is always think about including some kind of marketing in your budget because a lot of folks leave that piece out and it's that marketing that those do marketing dollars you're going to need to recruit your participants as well as your volunteers. Really great tips there, um, Sarah and Beth. Thank you for that. There are a few questions coming in. I think folks are interested in this RFP opportunity. So Sarah, could you remind people um, one more time about how they can access more information on applying for that funding? And maybe Absolutely. the timelines one more time, the timelines? Sure, sure. So our RFP is already posted on the Community Care Core website. So that's communitycarecore.org. Core is, has an S on the end, don't leave the S out. Um, and then um, if you go to the RFP page, you will see there uh, are all the documents you need. The RFP is there. The budget document is there, the work plan, the budget narrative, and then some sample documents about what your reporting requirements will be also. So all of that is already posted on the website. Once the portal opens um, on May 22nd, where we can start accepting submissions, that will also be posted on the website. So you can just go straight to communitycarecore.org for that link as well. And then, um, so the, the portal will be open from May 22nd to July 7th. Um, it will close promptly at 5 p.m. Eastern time on July 7th. And on um, June 6th, we are going to be having an informational webinar. The link for that is also located on our website. So you should have everything you need to, uh, to apply. Super. Um, just a couple more kind of detail-focused questions. But mm -hmm. there was a question about match. It, can folks use in kind for match or does it need to be a direct financial match if you have any information in, on that? In kind is great and we encourage you to use your volunteer hours. Volunteer hours is one of the things that we ask you to collect as part of your um, outputs and um, you can use your volunteer hours at the indirect um, at the uh, volunteer indirect uh, rate, which right now has gone up. So it used to be $29.95. I think it's $30.15 now. Please don't quote me on that. I haven't looked at that um, for a minute, but um, you can use the, the most current value for that to, to generate your in-kind match. Okay. You can also use space if people volunteer space for you, for Super. sure. Sounds like there's some good flexibility there. Um, Another question about the, the Community Care Corps, I think more for, for you, Sarah, but is there a particular type of education or training that's provided to the Community Care Corps grantees? We provide a ton of technical assistance. Um, Beth, you, part, you participate in a lot of our, our um, opportunities. So um, we talk about pretty much anything you need help on while you're while we're having our monthly calls. If you come with um, a question and we will try to connect you with someone who can answer that question. If we can't, um, if it's another grantee, we'll make those connections for you. We have learning collaboratives. Um, we have assistance with data collection. Beth, what am I leaving out? I'm sure I'm leaving a lot, something else. Oh, I think that's good. There is a lot of networking among grantees. Um, there's a learning collaborative this afternoon, in fact, and the, mm -hmm. the topic is um, culturally diverse volunteers and how to be more inclusive in your volunteer mm -hmm. volunteerism, which is another recruitment tip. Um, so yes, there's lots of opportunities for us to talk with each other and with the staff, Sarah and others, um, about our experiences and learn from each other. Awesome. We have so many questions coming into the chat, but I don't think we can get to them all. So I, I will say for anybody who chatted or typed a question in and we weren't able to respond to it, I, you, we, you know, you can access Sarah's information from the slides. We'll make sure to put that in the, in the chat if that would be helpful. You can also contact the commit to connect slash engaged staff team and we'll make sure to connect you to the speakers for any follow-up questions that you may have lingering. But Sarah and Beth, I wanted to thank you for your time in this segment today. That was very, very informative and we, we appreciate your, your contributions here today. It is um, 2.15, so we will now proceed to our 15 minute break to give all of our attendees a chance to take a little water or hydration or any type of break you may wish to take. But, we'll, but don't leave the Zoom room, stay connected. 
and we'll reconvene with our next panel session right at 2.30 p.m. Eastern time, so in 15 minutes. Thank you all for joining, with, joining us, and we'll see you again soon.
Okay, welcome back. I hope everyone got a, a little bit of a stretch break um, or water break or something of that nature. During our next section of the agenda, we will hear from a panel of speakers on supporting the social engagement and social connections of family caregivers. We will first hear from Dr. Fawn Cothran, who serves as the Hunt Research Director at the National Alliance for Caregiving. Dr. Cothran will provide context on social isolation and loneliness among caregivers before introducing our panelists for a discussion on the barriers to engagement that family caregivers face and how organizations can develop programs, activities, and outreach practices that support caregiver social engagement, benefiting both family caregivers and the people they support. So Dr. Cothran, thank you for being here with us today and I'll hand it off to you. Thank you, Meredith. Alrighty. Thank you for that introduction. It is my pleasure to be your moderator this afternoon. And thank you to US Aging, sponsors, and organizers for coordinating such an important summit. Although we are in a virtual format, I do want to acknowledge that the National Alliance for Caregiving is physically housed on the traditional lands of the Anacostan and Piscataway peoples. We have an exciting lineup of panelists for you today, but before I introduce our speakers, I wanna set the stage a bit by providing a brief overview of what we currently know about social isolation and loneliness among family caregivers. The National Alliance for Caregiving produces a landmark report, Caregiving in the US every five years in partnership with AARP. It is the most widely cited research on family caregiving across the lifespan and across condition. And it is one of the few data sets with broad demographic representation of family caregivers in the US. From our 2020 report, we know that of America's 53 million unpaid family caregivers, one out of five reports feeling alone. More specifically, this includes caregivers who live with their care recipient or care partner, caregivers who are unmarried, caregivers who identify as LGBTQ+, and primary caregivers, sole caregivers are those who provide the majority of unpaid care. Also caregivers who use social media, including those who use social media as a source of help or information, or connection with other caregivers through online or social media support groups. This also includes high intensity caregivers, which is based on the number of hours of care, the number of activities of daily living performed, such as bathing, feeding, or dressing, and the number of instrumental activities of daily living performed, such as transportation, grocery shopping, or paying bills. Finally, this also includes caregivers who provide 21 or more hours of care, the equivalent of a part-time job. And perhaps unsurprisingly, as the years of providing care increases, so does the feeling of being alone. Family Caregiving in Diverse Communities, a 2021 report in partnership with the Diverse Elders Coalition, highlights that racially, culturally, and linguistically diverse caregivers experience significantly high isolation. On top of the complex yet often invisible role of caregiving, diverse family caregivers are also interpreting in appointments, translating documents, as well as navigating immigration and naturalization processes. During the pandemic, diverse family caregivers identified social isolation as their number two challenge behind anxiety. About one in four caregivers reported feeling more isolated and Hispanic or Latinx and LGBTQ plus caregivers reported the highest rates of social isolation. Now with this background, it becomes clear that not only can caregiving increase feelings of isolation and loneliness for a variety of reasons, but the pandemic has only made this worse, especially in diverse communities. While this broad overview begins to highlight how critical caregiver engagement is, equitable social engagement programs and practices are possible. For example, tailored resources that target culturally and linguistically diverse caregivers, 
expanded criteria for programs such as how is family defined and who qualifies, or considering different hours of operation to account for the varied schedules of caregivers, particularly working caregivers. And finally, empowering caregivers as the expert partners they are to inform the realities and opportunities of programs and practices. Now, these are just some beginning thoughts, but our panelists today will give us some concrete examples and ideas based on their experiences. With that, I would like to introduce our panelists today. Jennifer Harbison, Case Management Caregiver Support Specialist with Age Well. Beth Salzberg, Director of the Alzheimer's Related Disease Alzheimer's Dementia Family Support Program with Jewish Family and Children's Service, and Leslie Katz, Caregiver Services and Health Promotion Coordinator with Loudoun County Area Agency on Aging. Now, as you have questions, please feel free to add them into the Q&A and we will address them during our discussion period. But with that, I will turn it over to our very first speaker, Jennifer. Jennifer, please take it away. I'll try that again. Thank you very much, Fawn. And it's really a delight to be here um, with all of you this afternoon. Um, I'm uh, coming to you from Vermont, um, from just outside of Burlington. And I work with an organization called Age Well, which is an area agency on aging. It's the largest area agency on aging in Vermont. Um, there are four um, other organizations um, similar organizations um, that cover the rest of the state. Um, I'd like to share with you um, some information or some observations about what we've, ex we've experienced through our respite squad volunteer program. Um, this is a subset of our volunteer, our larger volunteer program, which the as a whole um, includes our Meals on Wheels volunteers and our um, friendly visitors and friendly callers. But the respite squad is a is a special group. Um, the idea sort of was developed in 2019 um, by colleagues working um, across both the volunteer department and the caregiver support department, which is which is where I sit. Um, as you can understand, it it sort of went on hiatus very quickly, unfortunately, in 2020 and 2021 um, because of COVID. Um, but it was recognized by the National Association of Areas on Aging, agency, agency, agencies on aging in 2021 um, as, a, as a program that um, they um, were encouraged that had you know, some, some merit and wanted to recognize that. Um, in a nutshell, what our respite squad volunteers agree to do is to provide three, three to four, regular hours of week um, of respite to one family that they are matched with. Um, before the match, the respite volunteers receive 12 hours of training um, through AgeWell. And that training covers things um, such as, um, you know, dementia awareness, because although a respite volunteer can be matched with, with any family where there's a caregiver looking after someone with a with a chronic illness. What we found in practice is that um, it's the caregivers who are, who are supporting their loved one with dementia or perhaps with Parkinson's and Parkinson's related dementia um, who's who's who have an intensity of, of caregiving and an intensity of need um, that is that is really striking. Um, so um, for that reason, our training course does uh, provide some dementia um, education, some awareness of the disease to, de to demystify it. Um, there are a lot of um, myths and un unfounded fears about what someone with dementia is like. Um, and so we try to tackle those head on. Um, we discuss um, and inform our volunteers about um, you know, the concept of anticipatory grieving, which is something that they may encounter in the caregivers that they're supporting, um, you know, what it is and, and how to be helpful. Um, and then once that period of training is um, done, um, there's a very careful um, matching exercise that our volunteer team leads on. Um, to make sure that it's a good fit both for the volunteer and for the caregiving family. 
um, and the caregiving family, we're looking both at the fit for the caregiver and the fit for the care recipient the care recipient. Um, if we're placing someone with a family um, in which there is someone living with dementia, we want to make sure that the volunteer is comfortable providing, you know, dementia informed companionship while the caregiver is um, taking respite in, what, in whatever form um, that's best for them. Um, the, our program is um, small at the moment. We have 31 active, trained respite squad volunteers. And of that 31, um, 22 are currently matched with a caregiving family. Um, and I'll talk a little bit later um, when we get a chance to talk about the barriers to engagement as to why we, we haven't yet been able to match all 31 um, of our volunteers. Um, so thinking a little bit about sort of the theme of this conference and how um, you know, the notion of, of social engagement really plays into our volunteer, respite volunteer program. Um, you know, I'd like to look at it from the, from the point of view of the sort of the three categories of participants, if you like. So the caregivers, the care recipients, and the volunteers themselves. Um, because from our observations, the, this program has important social impacts on all three of those groups. Um, so starting with the caregivers, you know, for caregivers on a, with this respite program, they understand um, and appreciate that they're going to get a regular weekly contact um, with a consistent adult who is not their care recipient. And for some caregivers, this, this may be the only adult outside of the family, outside of their care, their care relationship that they may see regularly during the week. Um, it also provides for caregivers the time and the space for caregivers to, main, to maintain activities outside the home or indeed to reestablish connections, social connections outside the home that maybe have, you know, fallen by the wayside as the demands of caregiving um, have increased. So I think the, the, um, the impact on social engagement for caregivers is very clear by creating by creating that time and space, um, caregivers can seek out, the, they have an opportunity to seek out social engagement, um, either old of the uh, old or new. Um, for care recipients, of course, um, a respite volunteer coming in once a week, steadily, week after week, provides a safe connection safe new connection with the outside world. And this can be, um, this can be really empowering. Um, and also, you know, it provides a, st a steady um, uh, source of socialization, um, particularly in um, a care recipient with, with dementia or some cognitive impairment, um, being able to engage with someone in, you know, who, who is not a family member, but who is a safe, um, dementia informed person um, is um, is a wonderful gift, I think. Um, and then lastly, the volunteers. Um, in our experience, you know, of those 31 volunteers that I spoke of, um, several of them are former caregivers, former family caregivers themselves. And they're using the volunteering role as a way of emerging from their own caregiving journey, um, during which they may themselves have been very isolated. And so they're, you know, reaching out um, and getting back into engagement with the wider world. Um, it's also, of course, a validation of the skills that they gained through their own experience in supporting um, their care recipient um, through their chronic illness or their dementia. Um, the volunteers have told us that they feel connected, you know, be, by virtue of the training, the 12 hours of training, um, that immediately creates a group that they feel connected to. Um, and that may be, again, the first group, if, if they're a caregiver, you know, sort of returning, looking outward from the family for the first time in a while, um, that group may be the first, the, the first group um, that they encounter um, after their caregiving experience. 
And our volunteers also, as, as part of our program, receive period, periodic follow-up calls from our volunteer team um, to check in to see, to see how the match is going. Um, volunteers always have access to our volunteer team should anything happen during the course of a visit or should any concerns arise um, that the volunteer would like to talk through. So there, there are good um, to and from um, communication um, methods that are open to the volunteers. Uh, and I think all of that, all of that helps to engage, um, engage them and connect them. Um, you know, we have a very small sample size um, with our 31, with our 31 volunteer uh, respite squad volunteers, but there we do have some early data that's emerging. Um, in a caregiver survey, 100% of caregivers reported that um, within three months of a match, they experienced or they felt decreased burden and decreased isolation. Um, specifically, 93% said that they somewhat or strongly agreed that I feel less lonely. And 85% said that they somewhat or strongly agreed that I feel I have close ties to other people. One um, kind of data point that really struck me um, was that after a respite squad match, 44% more caregivers reported being able to spend time with friends. And this was, this was um, really quite, uh, quite an important thing. It, it was. It was that activity was what they had listed as what they had they most wanted to be doing if they were able to take time away from their person. Um, and so, um, to see that increase was wonderful. Um, Thirty-eight percent of caregivers reported that after a match, they felt not at all disconnected, um, whereas before the match about that same percentage had, had stated that they felt very disconnected um, from society and community. So as I say, that's very early data. It's a small sample size. Um, but I thought I would also um, give you a sense um, in their own words um, of a couple of pieces of feedback that we've had. Um, so this, this um, first piece is from, it was written by one of my volunteer um, colleagues, um, volunteer team colleagues, writing about an interaction um, that she'd had with a caregiver. And she said, um, the caregiver's partner has dementia and cannot be left alone. And she was feeling the full weight of responsibility when I first spoke with her before the match. We worked on setting up a few supports, including the respite squad. And today I talked to her and she was upbeat and happy and said, things are going as well as they can. She said her volunteer comes reliably every Friday morning and she is able to get to the YMCA for an exercise class that has done wonders for her mental health. A second anecdote comes directly from a caregiver. The caregiver wrote, I feel confident that, that somebody, not just a warm body, is really engaging my mom. I've been there when the volunteer is there and I am struck by how much she puts into it. She brings treats, music my mom might wanna to listen to, reads to her, goes through photo albums. It feels really good to know that someone good is there. I know that one day a week is my own and I can look forward to this on Wednesdays. As a, you know, I think one of the the one of the things um, that we're working on now in Vermont is um, scaling up. So, you know, how do we go from 31 volunteers, 31 respite squad volunteers focused largely on age wells um, uh, service area, to a, a respite volunteer program that spans the state of Vermont? Um, age well. Um, does have um, a two-year contract with our um, Department of A um, Aging and Independent Living to work with the other AAAs in the state to expand the program. Um, at this point, the train the trainer part of that contract is done. 
um, and it's now over to those AAAs to begin training their own respite volunteers and to build up their own um, respite squads. Um, I think a couple of barriers that have already become clear is that, you know, the recruitment of volunteers is always a challenge. Um, AgeWell, we're in a slightly different position because we're in the least rural and most populated part of the state. Um, so I think that um, makes a big difference. Um, and also because AgeWell is the largest area agency on aging in Vermont, um, the caregiver support team and the volunteer team um, really are able, are large enough that they're really able to focus on those roles. Um, in some of the smaller agencies, uh, family caregiver support specialists or folks in charge of, of the volunteer program, you know, are wearing more than one hat. Um, and that makes um, staffing and implementing um, a new initiative really quite difficult. Um, so I think those that's sort of in a nutshell what I wanted to share with you about our respite squad program. Um, and I very much look forward um, to questions and discussion. Thank you so much, Jennifer. I'm pretty excited about that program too. Um, so now we'll turn it over to our next speaker. Um, so Beth, if you could go ahead and take it away, I'll turn it over to you. So much fun and thank you, Jennifer. Great to hear about the Respite Squad. And I appreciate the opportunity to be with you all here. I'm gonna talk about memory cafes, which are at their heart, social gatherings. The focus is helping both um, individuals living with dementia and those who care about them, which can include family members, it can include neighbors, friends as well, um, to, to um, decrease that social isolation that is so often an avoidable side effect of dementia. No one owns the CAFE model, so I'm going to describe some typical features of CAFEs. However, there are um, individual cafes that diverge in one way or another. Dr. Bear Meeson started the very first cafe in Leiden, Holland in 1997. And since then, they've spread globally as a social movement. They are um, designed and run by thousands of passionate and creative people throughout the United States. Kathy, thank you for the shout out in the chat. Um, a, a memory cafe um, coordinator and fan who's here with us today, and I'm sure there are many more. Um, so programs may vary, and that's that's a good thing. But I'm going to talk with you about a couple of key features and how they benefit the family or friend care partner, as well as the person living with dementia. So very important that usually no one is asked if they have a diagnosis or what it is. So it's um, different from a lot of the programs that we provide and that we aren't going through that intake process and finding out um, kind of more clinical information about the participant. And it's important because there is so much stigma regarding dementia. And also it can take a long time and be really hard to get a diagnosis, especially if someone is in a community where there's not a lot of access to specialists, primarily doesn't speak English or a host of other barriers. So not everyone really can get a diagnosis. Um, and then people with more advanced dementia may not realize that they're living with dementia or people just may not wanna hear about it. And so oftentimes a care partner, a family or friend can become isolated because of those barriers and the memory cafes really try to open that door back open. The cafe is really designed for both the person living with dementia and for the family member or friend. The activities are designed to interest and challenge people with a wide range of cognitive needs and abilities. And they often involve the creative arts because there there's no right or wrong answer. They tap into the emotions and people can engage in many ways. Um, and a lot of times there's a focus on building in different um, sensory components so that people can participate, even if, let's say, language is becoming difficult for them. I've heard the phrase used, respite together. So I think what, Jennifer, you were describing is so vital for there to be a chance to have respite apart where somebody could get to the why or see a friend 
who they might not otherwise be able to spend time with. And there's also a need for the partners to have something joyful to do together. So some of the things that can happen at a cafe are that people can meet others who are in a similar situation. So a spouse or an adult child may meet up at the coffee table. They may exchange contact information, but even if they don't, they have that moment of connecting, maybe sitting and chatting together, and they feel less alone. People laugh, they get to feel curiosity, they get to feel the challenge of a new experience in a good way. And this can revitalize both the individual and the care relationship. Cafes should be like your local neighborhood coffee shop before Starbucks entered the scene. In other words, each one should be unique and tailored to its local community. There are cafes for specific linguistic and cultural communities. Cafes meet in a wide variety of settings. Some of my favorite types of settings are libraries, museums, restaurants, community centers, basically places that are not associated with one particular age group or disability per se, but are just open community spaces. Since the pandemic, memory cafes have gotten really creative about how to um, provide this ongoing social connection a lot converted to a virtual format, and then may, many have gone back to in-person, and a, a growing segment are grappling with ways to provide the program in a hybrid format, because what we've discovered is that some of our participants actually do better in a virtual environment. It's more accessible for some, and some of our participants really long to be in person and do better that way. So we are experimenting either with alternating virtual and in-person gatherings or ways using technology and multiple facilitators to um, have a virtual and an in-person cohort at the same time. Very challenging. Um, I want to just mention Sarah Masood's recent study, um, which was a um, qualitative study of Spanish and English speaking memory cafe participants, which showed that the benefits um, of the cafe model really carry through in a virtual format. And I just put the link there in the chat. So um, the one other piece I wanna mention is a little bit about how to encourage an individual or a care pair to try out a cafe. First and foremost, help spread the word because a lot of people in the United States have never heard of a memory cafe. So if I say the phrase support group, just about everybody gets a picture in mind of what that is. They might or might not be attracted to that kind of program, but they have this concept of people sitting in chairs in a circle and talking about a common challenge. If you say memory cafe, a lot of people have never heard of it. Now in Massachusetts and in Wisconsin, which have the greatest concentrations of memory cafes, I'm happy to say that more and more members of the general public have heard the phrase, but we're still at a pretty early stage in the United States. So the most important first step is that people have to hear about it and hear what it actually is, what happens there. And then second, a lot of times a um, family member will reach out and say, we would love, I would love to bring my mom or my friend or um, my spouse to your memory cafe, but I'm afraid that they won't be willing to try it because it's about dementia. So I want to say you don't have to frame it as being related to dementia. Um, and my favorite phrase regarding communication in the context of dementia is focus on the feelings, not the facts. I didn't come up with that phrase. I'm sure many of you know it, but it's a really helpful guide. So tune into what this person values, what interests them, and go from there. And you might say, you know, a friend of mine at work told me about this program they're going to have. Um, there's going to be a musician. It sounds really fun. There's going to be refreshments. I would love it if you would come with me. We don't have to stay the whole time if we don't like it, but let's just give it a try. No one there is going to ask this person if they're living with dementia or not. They're going to get there and there's going to be a fun gathering. And most of the time, people really enjoy it. Um, 
Finally, I want to make the point that not only does a primary care giver need the opportunity to spend time and do something joyful together with the person living with dementia, but they need breaks and they need that circle of care to stay wide enough. Um, no one can do this alone. And so memory cafes are a great opportunity for friends or more distant relatives, people in that sort of outer circle to stay involved and connected with the person living with dementia. Oftentimes these folks drift away because they don't know how to spend time together anymore. So if they're willing to commit to attending a cafe together once a month, let's say, then it provides a break for the primary person and it's a wonderful way to keep that relationship alive. That way the friend or family member isn't going to have to be maintaining the conversation or providing the activity. They're just making it happen, accompanying the person, participating along with them. And they'll sort of learn by osmosis some tips on dementia, inclusive communication and activities by being there. So um, lastly, I know that our hosts have some links for me to put in the chat. I want to let you know um, to find a cafe, there is a national directory, memorycafedirectory.com, and that has a virtual section as well as an in-person section. And um, we produced a one-minute video that shows cafes in action. We have it in English, Spanish, and Portuguese. So that's a great way to make this concept more tangible for someone who is considering attending a cafe or volunteering or funding a cafe for that matter. And finally, if any of you are interested in starting a cafe or just getting support with your ongoing cafe, we um, at Jewish Family and Children's Service have an initiative called The Percolator. We've been acting as a clearinghouse since 2014. We have toolkits, um, lots of resources, all for free. And the um, web page there was just posted. We also have quarterly idea exchanges to bring cafe leaders together and support one another. So with that, I thank you for the opportunity to share this model. And I would love to turn it over to Leslie. Thank you, Beth. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, Fawn. Wow, what a great panel. Um, so many exciting things that we can all learn from. Beth, having a memory cafe, starting a memory cafe is on my wish list and something that we're going to be doing. So this was so helpful. And Jennifer, um, this, this squad is something that we need to start in Loudoun County. So thank you both for all of this information today. Um, so I'm here to talk about our Caring for the Caregiver program. And I'm in Loudoun County, Virginia, in Northern Virginia. And something that's unique about our Agency on Aging is that we are part of the Department of Parks, Recreation, and Community Services. Um, we are part of Loudoun County government, but again, we're part of Parks and Rec. And something that's pretty amazing about that is that there really isn't a stigma when people are accessing services because we have a lot of fun activities that are going on at our senior centers and recreation centers and, and community centers. And so um, people are coming in the doors that way and there's it's all recreation. Now we are the community services piece. And so I'm here to share with you again, information about our caring for the caregiver program. Um, the first thing that we do when we are designing a program for caregivers is we think, how can we bring them in? What do caregivers need? Um, many times they say they don't know what they don't know. Um, they need education. They need support. They need friends. They need people who understand what it is that they're going through. And so that's what guides us when we're creating programs. So with our Caring for the Caregiver program, um, we start first with caregiver education programs, and that is usually the first thing that caregivers ask for when they reach out. So whether it's um, phone or email or coming into our office, they're asking for education programs. They're seeing our flyers um, around the county, and I'm, I will share with you the variety um, of ways that we get our information out there. Um, so our caregiver education programs are 
typically they're, um, they're virtual. We do a hybrid as well. So we will offer some in-person programs. They were all in-person prior to 2020. But what we have found is that the virtual option works really well for caregivers because they don't have to find someone to take care of their loved one. They can listen in. We can record the programs much easier. Um, we have family members who attend. So if the caregiver is in Loudoun County and they're listening in, they might invite their sister or their brother or another relative who's in another part of the country to join in and listen to that program. So we're able to also bring in a variety of speakers, um, topical experts who we probably wouldn't be able to have otherwise. So we offer these education programs um, at least once or twice a month. They're typically an hour in length, 45 minutes of information, and then um, we facilitate Q&A. So it's a webinar format. And again, all of the sessions are recorded and they're available for anyone after the fact. They're mostly held during business hours due to speaker availability and staff availability. Um, so that recording is very helpful for caregivers after the fact. Um, our goal is for every caregiver to feel confident in their role. We want them to feel empowered. We want them to have the education that they need so that they can take care of their loved one. And as I said before, they don't know what they don't know. So we give them all of it. We offer programs regularly on legal planning and financial planning, um, understanding dementia, caregiving 101, advanced care planning. Um, those are all the programs that we offer regularly. And then we sprinkle in more specialized topics. Like last week, we had a program on alcoholism and dementia. Um, we have sessions on anticipatory grief and ambiguous loss. Um, we had a program back um, in the fall that was in person. We had over 60 caregivers who attended and it was using improv um, in dementia care. And so that was a program that, I mean, it was interactive. They, everyone participated. They left with information that was so helpful that they could take with them to take care of their loved one. And they had fun. Um, we offer support groups. We have a Saturday support group that uh, we have, we've had great attendance. We have anywhere from 14 to 16 caregivers. We used to, when we offered it in person, we would have sometimes more than 20 caregivers and we'd have to split, split up into groups um, because it was just too big. We offer uh, support groups for people who have early stage dementia. And what's great about that is that that's great for the caregiver because they have a break and it's a way for them to have a connection as well. So they connect with other caregivers that way. Um, we also have, and this is a big part of what I said at the beginning about our department, we want our caregivers who participate in these programs to have fun. Um, that's what's lacking. I mean, that's something that we all need more of, something that um, can make this journey a little easier. So in addition to the education and support um, and learning from each other, we also offer programs like we have an art workshop for caregivers. So we bring together a group of caregivers on a Saturday and they get together and they learn how to paint. And then we give them a set of watercolors and a sketch pad and they can go home and they can do that together. We had one caregiver report during that program at the end of it. It was four hours, three hours plus lunch. And she said, I was so relaxed. I totally forgot that I had a husband and he's the one who's home with dementia with the caregiver. And we thought that's exactly what we want. She deserves that. She deserves that time to focus on herself, to meet other people um, and again, to have fun. Another program that we offer that uh, started in the last year is our hand chime group. And as far as we know, we're the only group of, of, the, of its kind where we have people with dementia, early to middle stage dementia, and their caregivers come together once a month and they use hand chimes to create music together. No musical experience is required. Um, we just had our spring concert yesterday and um, their, the most popular song that they did was Somewhere Over the Rainbow. Um, we have over 20 people who participate in that. And that's um, a great opportunity because it prevents isolation. It brings the caregiver and the person with dementia together. The caregiver then sees the person 
has purpose, that they have fun. And it's something that they can, uh, took a group of caregivers to the theater. Um, we did that um, back this uh, back this winter. And we uh, it was a dinner theater. We went for lunch. We saw something rotten. We had a great time. And on the bus to and from, we talked about all of the programs and services that we offer for caregivers and for older adults in Loudoun County. Um, I think that's that's pretty much all that I wanted to cover in terms of the programs that we offer. But something I just wanted to end with is that all of these programs can be replicated um, at fairly low cost. And I'm happy to be a resource for anyone who is interested in starting any of these. Um, try something, think about what you would enjoy doing, what you think would be fun and try it. And if it doesn't work, try something else. That's what we, that's what we do here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Leslie. And I, so this is so serious right now. You all, I have really enjoyed your presentations. That is not in my comments. I've really learned a lot. I'm familiar with the Memory Cafe, but just hearing all of the wonderful work that is happening um, is just really inspiring in terms of the support that is available. We're all really committed to supporting family caregivers um, because the reality is, is they need the support now, right? And so, you know, understanding these very innovative and creative ways of how you are approaching um, what can be done to decrease that isolation, to increase that, that level of engagement. I just say kudos, keep doing it, taking notes, and um, just really excited about the work you're doing. So with that, I will just say thank you again, all of you. And now we'll kind of shift to our discussion. And so we'll take some questions from the audience. And I see that there are some um, to get us started. So let me just pop that open really quickly. And I know that some questions um, were already answered, but let me just go through these again really quickly. And I will ask a couple of questions of my own. So one question that, that I do see here is for Beth. Beth, how do you encourage older adults to participate when they're not willing to go to date, adult daycare? Um, it's a good question, and um, the you know I think it does require a personalized response for each person. And again, I recommend focus on the feelings, not the facts. So tune into what that person values, what their fears or concerns or barriers may be, and and craft the response accordingly. But one idea that can work is to frame their role as volunteering. This can also work with day programs as well, um, but it's very easily done in a memory cafe. Um, in fact, our volunteers, and we do have a wide range of folks coming to volunteer, are almost indistinguishable from our other participants in many ways. I mean, we have a partnership with a college and we get the um, college students to do a lot of the sort of setting up and the more physical kinds of um, kinds of things, moving chairs if need be. But um, mostly what our volunteers do is greet people and mingle and make sure everyone has somebody to talk to. And, um, you know, it's easy enough to set up a, a, um, a volunteer role. And it, it could be something totally different than that. It could be, um, you know, we would like this person to keep an eye on the refreshment table and see if we're running low on coffee. You know, it really could be anything. So I think that um, the best first step would be to reach out to the contact person, talk with them about your situation, your, um, your care partner and brainstorm together. Great. Um, Jennifer, how do you recruit the respite squad volunteers? Well, you know, we do everything we possibly can think of. Um, we start um, with our sort of thousand strong um, volunteer team um, that are involved in our Meals on Wheels deliveries and our friendly visitors or friendly callers. Um, and so, you know, we already know that that um, that they're interested in volunteering and that they they you know that they like to give back. Um, so we you know spread the word regularly throughout that throughout that team. Um, we do social media. We have um, 
We have information posted on our website. Um, we participate in a um, kind of a closed circuit um, sort of local TV production. Um, and so caregiver support comes up you know, several couple of times a year, and we we talk about the respite. You know, we try to spread the word through that, so that if someone is someone is watching the the local closed circuit TV, um, that's a venue. Um, word of mouth. Um, we, I, as a caregiver support specialist, you know, I mention it. I mention volunteering um, to my to my caregivers um, when I'm closing a case, um, and um, just to kind of plant the seed, um, we're not we're not suggesting that that you know this is something that they must feel that they need to do. Um, but sometimes caregivers, you know, when they're not in a when their caregiving situation ends, they they can feel kind of at loose ends. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, as I mentioned before, a way to you know put the skills that they learned you know, really at the front line to put those skills to use um, can often be something that that um, is um, is really validating for them. So we we do everything. We we beat the bushes. <laughs> Thank you for that. And I, I just am going to ask a few more questions related to respite squad because there are just a couple more and then I'll move to a question for Leslie. Um, so really quickly, uh, Jennifer, what is the role of the respite squad volunteers? Do they do ADLs? We do not ask them to do ADLs on um, on a, a as a matter of course. So, if someone they they do receive training so that you know if if they're on a respite visit and there's a toileting accident or or something like that or someone something gets spilled and it's important you know it's important to help someone to you know to change, um, they are equipped to do that. But that is not part of their regular um, role. Right, with their, where our focus is on companionship for the the care recipient, um, and you know supervision and and safety. Thank you for that. So, in you know another way to put it is our respite squad volunteers are not really substitutes for a home care attendant who would be doing the ADLs kind of in full. <laughs> All right, excuse me, I was just scrolling through some of the questions again. Okay, if I may shift a little bit and thank you again, Jennifer, um, I'll be coming back to you, everyone again eventually. So uh, Leslie, how do you advertise your programs in Loudoun County? So happy that that question was asked. So we have, um, we've really figured it out of how to bring people in. So first, um, we medical providers. So we have material that we distribute to medical offices, um, PTs, OTs, neurologists, family practices, I mean, across the board, dentist offices. We put together um, packets of information so that, for example, if somebody sees the neurologist, the neurologist can just hand a folder that has information about our agency on aging, that has um, a flyer for the support groups, um, information about the adult day centers or the senior centers. So we all have, we have that together. Um, that's, that's one medical providers, um, two, the, we use our local school district to disseminate information. Um, we contact, we have a relationship with the, with, um, someone in HR, I believe in like an employee specialist. And so any kind of, um, employee health fair that they offer, we, will go to and have a table. Um, we've done presentations for um, when they offer programs for upcoming um, retirees. And so we will present there. Um, we get our information into their employee newsletter. Uh, we also have relationships with the school social workers and the school counselors. And so that way, if the school social worker or the school counselor is working with a family and can see that there's a need for support for um, an older adult, then there you go. We've, we've shared that information. Um, and then the other, the, the third place that we've had a lot of success is with places of worship. 
Um, we have some very large churches in our area. We have synagogues, we have mosques. And so what we do is if there's an opportunity in between services or after a service on a Sunday, we will have an outreach table. Um, there's always opportunities to do presentations at the church. And so we'll do that as well, again, on Caregiving 101 or something that's of interest to that particular group. Um, and that has been wildly successful in terms of bringing people in. That's wonderful. A question came through the chat just to piggyback on that. Do you think that your program would be as successful if there were, um, if it were not in a more, if it were in a more rural or less affluent area? Um, I do because half of Loudoun County is rural and we do bring people in from the Western part of the, of the county. And it's not, um, and I mean, we are, we are um, labeled as the wealthiest county in the United States every time that survey comes out. Um, and there are a lot of scams that happen after that. But so I wish that they would stop saying that about us. But we, um, we, I think that we would be, I think that we would be because our programs, um, they're, they're not income based. Um, anybody can participate and they're educational, they're empowering, and they're fun. So yes, I do think that we'd be just as successful in other parts of the country and in more rural areas. But again, you have to be creative. So what's available in that rural area? How do you get the word out? Um, one thing that you can do that we're working on if you are in a county that is more rural, um, mass mailings. So it, it costs less than you would think, but you can buy a list and work with a company, a mailing company, and send out postcards to age groups that are, you know, people 50 and over who live in certain zip codes, and then just send a postcard with the um, name of your organization, the number to call, and something like, we're here to, you know, we're here to help. Are you um, an older adult? Are you a caregiver? Whatever, whatever you want to say on that postcard, and that's a way to get the information out. Thank you, Leslie. Actually, I, I did literally take a couple of notes because like, this is great. I just, um, anyway, this is my my bias. I'm here like as a moderator, but I'm also just taking notes too because I do really feel like we can all learn with and from each other, especially when the bottom line is um, the caregivers that we serve. So I have a question for everyone. Well, there are a lot of great questions coming in. Um, one question that I think is a they're all great questions. Um, one is for everyone again, how are these programs funded? And, and Jennifer, if I could take it back to you, would you mind starting us off with this? And then we can go Beth and Leslie again. Sure, um, we, we use a variety of sources of funding. Um, uh, we use um, Older American Act funding. Um, we use funding um, that comes to us um, from the state of Vermont. Um, so from the Department of Aging and Independent Living. Um, and we also use um, funding that, you know, that AgeWell, AgeWell has sourced. Um, so we have a pretty active, um, you know, we're not for profit, but we have a pretty active um, fundraising team um, that has enabled us to, you know, to expand Meals on Wheels, for example, beyond what we've been able to do, and and that has been able to cover um, the um, the volunteer program, you know, the the overheads for the volunteer program as well. So it's a it's a it's a variety of sources of funding. Great, thank you, Beth. Would you mind jumping in? Already ready to go. So we're. Um, so each memory cafe is independently run. So the way the programs are funded really varies. It is quite a cost effective model. It um, can cost um, just, you know, whatever the refreshments are, which often are provided uh, or can be provided by um, um, an, a local cafe or supermarket. And sometimes people have success getting the in-kind donations. Um, and, you know, basic supplies, if there is a staff person who's able to facilitate it, the biggest cost is that staff person's time. Um, so um, I find that cafes fund their program in all sorts of ways. Many get grants from local or regional foundations. Some are able to tap into statewide funds. Um, many do have um, sponsorships from businesses. Some will get honorary or memorial sponsorships from 
community members, there's a whole host. If, if anybody's interested, so our next idea exchange, which is happening June 14th on Zoom, um, I'm gonna put in the meeting registration link here. Um, one of the things we're focusing on is ways to fund memory cafes. And we'll be talking about the results of a network survey on how people are funding their cafes currently. Um, just one other point on that. So cafes are um, happening in all kinds of communities, rural, urban, suburban, um, and in many different cultural communities. That said, they are less likely to be happening in communities that face significant resource barriers for the reason that they face significant resource barriers. So, um, you know, while it is a cost-effective program, it has a cost. And I'm hoping that more um, funders may take notice of the need to specifically target funds to um, cafes in communities with fewer resources or facing more disparities. Thanks. Looks like you're ready to go, Leslie, please share. Yes, okay. So we receive um, Title III caregiver funds um, from ACL that then goes to um, Virginia Department of Aging and Rehabilitative Services and then to us. Um, we also use our Title III-B um, outreach funds as a way to get the word out. Um, a lot of our marketing material, flyers, if we take an ad out um, in the local newspaper, we'll use funds from that. Um, but our programs are actually, they don't cost very much. I mean, we if we provide lunch, then that might be a few hundred dollars. But otherwise, I mean, we're our, the presenters are not charging us. Um, the support group, we don't, you know, that doesn't cost anything. The hand chimes, that was a one-time cost. So we really aren't spending a whole lot on um on this, on this, these kinds of efforts, the big, the biggest cost is really the marketing and um, things like there was a question that came through on buying a mailing list, and I'm happy to talk with anybody offline about that and who to work with for that kind of information. Um, but even that cost is not significant. But and all of that comes from again Title Three B funds. Right. Thank you. So we still have quite a few questions in here, but I don't know that we're going to be able to get to all of them. So um, one thing I'd like to do is just ask our speakers as we um, kind of wrap up, if, if there's just one thing that you could leave with our audience today, um, what would that one thing be that you would really like to impart? Um, and I'll start with, um, I guess, you, Leslie, again, if you don't mind. Um, well, so as I said, I, I all of our programs are very easy to replicate, and I think that the best thing that anyone can do is to just try something. Um, we've tried things that haven't worked. We had a caregiver book club that worked for about a year and then didn't work, so we stopped, and now we're doing something else. So I think that that's really the best thing is just to try it um, and think when you're when you are getting ready to start something. Um, think about what you would want, you know, what would you want to know as a caregiver or what activity would you want to do? Um, and be thinking, is it accessible? Is it convenient? Um, what are the barriers? And use that as a way to guide you um, and you'll be successful in whatever program you end up offering in your community. Thanks, Leslie. Beth, you mind if I turn it over to you? I'll just say um, joy is a necessity in life. People have to have opportunities to have fun and joy. That's what provides energy, motivation, and a fresh perspective. That's all. Thanks. Thank you. And last but not least, Jennifer, would you mind sharing your final thoughts? I was just thinking, I was reading the, the questions in the chat and also which dovetailed, one of them dovetailed nicely into something that, that we've been wrestling with particularly um, uh, at recently at AgeWell. And that is the, that, um, you know, lack of knowledge or um, perhaps just the mythology of what dementia is um, or what Parkinson's disease is. Um, can you know create barriers to caregivers coming forward and so what you know what i would just love to see as a starting point is just to bring bring dementia dementia education um, folks living with dementia to bring them into the mainstream 
um, so that, you know, dementia becomes, you know, no stranger than, you know, kidney disease or heart disease. Um, and then um, we, I think that that will make it ever so much easier to, you know, connect caregivers with services to recognize the hard work that caregivers are doing, for caregivers to understand that they are indeed doing hard work. This is this is highly skilled um, support that they're offering to their loved one. Um, so yes, I would be an advocate for, you know, for a dementia friendly, dementia informed society. I support that as well. <laughs> Well, thank you, everyone. This has been a great discussion. Um, and thank you to our panelists. Please join me in thanking everyone for their time and their expertise. Um, I also want to thank all of you and the audience for joining today, as well as your questions. And I do apologize that we couldn't get to all of them, but thank you so much for joining. And now I'll turn it back over to Meredith. Thank you so much. Super. That was fantastic. Thank you to all of you for that. Um, we're now going to shift our focus to communicating with impact, which is such an essential component to ensure the success and sustainability of these types of programs and activities. So we'll be hearing from John Valenson, who serves as president of SCP, formerly Strategic Communications and Planning, a certified B corporation, and socially responsible communications and public relations firm, which he founded in 1987. John will share tips on how to communicate strategically to reach potential participants. We saw that come up in some of the, the Q&A and dialogue there with social engagement opportunities and how to communicate your program's impact to funders and stakeholders. So um, John, I'll turn it to you. I believe you're doing the screen share as well. Is that right? Yes. I'm gonna, okay, I'll, so you should I'll have access. So it's, it's all yours. Excellent. Excellent. Well, thank you, Meredith, and uh, thank you, uh, U.S. Aging and the Administration for Community Living for holding this uh, important uh, conference and, and uh, sharing this really important information. And thank you for that previous panel. I was able to, uh, to, to get on a little early and listen, and I think a lot of the ideas that came up during the course of the, uh, of the, uh, of the questions and actually during the presentations are really informative and supportive of, of a lot of what I'm, I'm going to be talking about. Uh, today. So uh, let me just uh, share my screen. Let's see the square sheen square sheen screen share is loading. There we go. Excellent. So uh, again, I'll be talking about communicating effectively about social engagement programs. And uh, SEP, as Meredith noted, uh, stands for strategic communications and planning. So today I will First of all, provide a very short course uh, over the next sort of 15 minutes or so on thinking strategically uh, and uh, to create a framework to help us all uh, get more effective at engaging people around uh, social engagement. That will also include messaging about how we talk about the issue and ultimately tactics and tips. We've already heard a number of good ones in the last session. And uh, actually, I'm going to open it up to all of you to chat in ideas about, uh, about, uh, about what has been successful, maybe crowdsource a, a bunch of ideas that can help all of us uh, communicate, engage, and recruit people into our programs. So let's talk just briefly about thinking strategically. Um, you know, first things first, right? So the, when, whenever we have a communications uh, challenge for any of our clients, or even in the work I do uh, as a board member, for uh, Surrey Services for um, uh, seniors in, in um, Southeast Pennsylvania or the Foundation for Health Equity here in Philadelphia, uh, we always will try to put a um, strategic communications lens on that problem. And it begins, first of all, with identifying our goals and objectives, starting with the end in mind, uh, understanding the environment, and then ultimately learning about your audience before we then turn our attention to messaging and tactics. So let's talk about these three, um, uh, these three issues. Um, so let's talk about goals and objectives. So um, most of the time when we are thinking about communications or oftentimes when we're thinking about communications and engagement, about social engagement or about anything else really, uh, we oftentimes have these broad um, sort of uh, goals that we have for our work. So a broad goal might be 
to raise awareness of our caregiver support group. Now, there is nothing wrong with that. And again, it kind of frames much more, more generally sort of what it is that we're trying to achieve. But in terms of planning and, and becoming effective in our communications or our recruitment engagement, um, a more sm a smarter uh, objective can be much more healthy, uh, helpful, helpful, excuse me. Uh, smart objectives, as many of you know, are um, uh, specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time bounded. And so for this caregiver support group, um, we, we, might, we might set out as smart objectives that by the end of 2000, June 2023, that everyone in the Surrey community, Surrey Services community, where I serve on the board, hears about the, the uh, caregiver support group, either in person, via email or Facebook, at least three times, that we identify 25 to 50 people who may so, need social support for more generally, either as caregivers or more generally because again, that, that might be useful for the organization uh, as a whole. And ultimately we wanna to try to recruit six to eight caregivers into the support group. So as you can see from that, uh, from the, the, the information on the right, that gives you a very helpful um, framework and, and, and uh, uh, way of thinking about the work, about how, much, how many people we're trying to get to, how, much, how, many, how many resources we might need, what other types of, um, uh, people we would we we might need to engage in order to to get there, and ultimately how to know that we our recruitment efforts, our communications efforts are indeed successful. So once we have the um, you know what we the, the the so these are the kind of the key things that we need to ask: what are our broad goals for for our program for our communications, and then what are these smart or measurable objectives? Next, we want to think about the environment, right? So, so what's going on out there? What's going on in here? So, you know, what's what's happening in the media um, around social engagement, around caregiver support? In this case, what are what are others in the community doing or talking about, communicating about your issue around whether it's older adults or engagement or other other things that are related to the um, to the issue that you're you're most interested in? And then, what else is going on in your organization? Because chances are there are a variety of communications vehicles that will be in place, but that may be um, focused on, uh, on issues or on programs that are not necessarily exactly yours, but related to yours. So if there's a big push to, uh, to find more volunteers for an organization, then your, your work to find, say, volunteers to, uh, to support the, a caregiver support program or one of the programs that was just described in the previous session um, could be uh, engaged to to help with your specific need. So again, you want to know what your goal and objective is, and then you want to know sort of what's going on out in the environment and then in your organization that may serve as a barrier to um, what you're trying to achieve and or what it, or perhaps support the work that you're going to be doing. And then third, um, you want to think about your audience. And again, this this issue came up a number of times in the previous um, in in the previous session. Um, but you really need to figure out a, a, a little bit or as much as possible, really, about the people that you're trying to um, recruit. So, you know, what do they know about your idea, your program, your service? What are their values? What do they care about? What are the things that are really pressing on them? What are, the, what are, their, what are their problems and concerns, right? Um, and then how do they pre prefer to get their information? Do they want to hear it from other people? Do they get, do, are they on email? Are they in social media? Um, do they hear it from their kids or from their parents uh, that, or from, from their other family members? Again, how do they, they want to get information? How do they generally get their information? And how can you engage those sources of information in a helpful way? And if you're trying to target, a, say, a funder or a specific influencer or decision maker, it may be helpful to create what we call a stakeholder profile, right? To understand what his or her jobs, pains, and gains are. Now, jobs are sort of what what they do every day, and so in in order to be um, uh, in, in order to do their job, right? What are the different kinds of tasks that they do every day? What are the what are the um, uh, the day to day activities that they uh, are, they do as part of their work? Um, and uh, you know, how can your work connect to or be part of them getting their job done. And then more specifically, sort of how might your program or your work um, connect to the things that they're trying to avoid, their pains, right? And more positively, how can supporting your program, for example, uh, be a kind of gain, a win for them and indeed for you? 
So all of that is part of sort of getting to know your audience. And in fact, you know, the, the way we do that can vary. Now, it depends on your, uh, it will depend on your budget and, and uh, again, your current uh, connection to the people that you're trying to recruit. But you will certainly want to do some kinds of, of mini assessments, either online um, or, you know, through, through um, SurveyMonkey or through other, uh, through, say, Twitter or Facebook surveys, perhaps, that, again, give you a sense of sort of what people know about a particular program or issue about social engagement in this case. Um, you may want to uh, uh, deputize other people in your organizations to, uh, in your organization to uh, ask existing gatherings or groups uh, about uh, things that you're that, that you're you're considering, and what you know what would people think about a caregiver support group? What you know what are the what what do you see as a problem, or what what might be seen as a barrier, or, or what might be seen as a way of um, engaging people effectively in that group? What are the other types of uh, caregiving and other uh, support groups that are out there, either online? or in person. Again, using the existing, uh, existing groups and gatherings as a way of, again, getting some of this basic information. You may not have you know, thousands of dollars to do, uh, to do uh, polls or, or really deep surveys uh, of people. You may not have time to do key, uh, a lot of key informant interviews, et cetera, but even um, talking to three or four or five people who represent the, um, the target audience that you're trying to reach can be really helpful. And then even uh, using social media poll, your social media uh, platforms to ask questions or to poll people in your community can, are, is another, again, very low cost and uh, simple way of getting some feedback on, on questions that, that will inform how you market or how you communicate uh, about social engagement programs. So once you have some of that, that strategic framework or strategic foundation uh, understood, you can turn your attention then to messaging. So you have your sense of objectives, right? What, what you're trying to achieve. You have a sense of the, 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 of the um, environment and the audience, right? And then the question is, what am I gonna say to that audience in the service of my objectives? So um, a number of things to think about in terms of messaging. First of all, by definition, uh, just for a little definition, uh, lots of times people will conflate uh, the message with the actual tactic itself so that you know, a Facebook campaign might be a kind, or Facebook, um, it would be a Facebook message or Facebook post, people might con conceive of as a message. But in the communications world, we like to think of a message as a clear, concise statement or set of statements that describes a position, opinion, a point of view, a program. And again, this is, these are the words, in fact, that you're going to use to, um, uh, to communicate about, uh, uh, about, again, your social engagement program and or about the, um, about the work that you're trying to do. Um, let's see here, sorry, just to cut the, uh... and again, I think one of the things that you, you wanna remember about your message is that it has to be distilled down. I love this New Yorker cartoon. If you were to boil your book down to a few words, what would be its message? You know, as someone who is running a program about uh, a social engagement program, you know, you know all about the sort of the background and the importance of social engagement and why people should be involved and the various details, et cetera. But for the most part, folks don't have uh, the attention span or the, the, um, the, the ability to focus on something more than one or two ideas at a time. And indeed, distilling down the complexity and the importance of your program and, and your offering into a few words is really critical. Um, one of the ways that we like to, to think about messaging is to focus on what we call the one thing, right? And that means filling, filling out the, the ends of each of, this, of each of these sentences, that the one thing your audience needs to know about your social engagement program is. Now, it's the audience, not just generally what, what people should know, but what should your audience know about your, um, uh, about your program. The reason it's important is the one thing people should do is the call to action and then creating a sense of urgency. One reason the audience should act now is, all right? And so using this quite simple sort of framework is a way for you to kind of come up, come up with, again, sharp and, and compelling messages that can be helpful in your communications around social engagement programs. So for example, the Caregiver Support Group is a new online program moderated by a local uh, licensed social worker that is there for you when you're frustrated, concerned, or need help on a specific caregiving problem. 
a simple, straightforward um, uh, description of the program, why it's important. Caregiving can be hard and isolating for all of us. We all need help at times and we can all help others facing similar challenges. Uh, the third, the third uh, piece of the one thing, what should they do? So contact Tina at uh, TinaQ at Surrey.org to learn more, sign up, or let us know if you are looking for help with caregiving or any other issue. And the last set to create a sense of urgency, please join today and reserve your spot as registration is limited. So this is not a, you know, this, this kind of message here is not a bumper sticker, right? It's not a, it's not a little piece of poetry. It's a little bit more prosaic than that. But as you can see, this kind of language can be used in a variety of different um, uh, 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 circumstances that can be very helpful in, um, in the, um, in, 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 in setting up your communications and various outreach opportunities. All right, so that's messaging and some, some thoughts on, on, on social engagement messaging. You know, first of all, we, we heard last time that we should focus on the, the feelings and not the facts, which I think is, I, I'd like to offer a, I thought that was really excellent actually. I wanna kind of offer a corollary, which is to focus on the benefit and not just the attributes of the programs. You know, what, not just what the, you have to describe what the program is about for sure, but um, you know what? What are the what does the audience see as the potential benefit for this work? Now, in the case of for example, caregiving and even social engagement, social connection, you know, you want to remember that there are extroverts out there that really would like to be part of a group, but there are also introverts who perhaps are looking more for one-on-one -on -one connection. And so, you want to get a clear sense of sort of um, uh, what the benefit is for them versus the benefit for other types of people. Um, in general, in terms of the language, I am a, a, a uh, a uh, trained reframing aging uh, 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 trainer. And uh, we lot of, like to talk in our, in our communications about we and not they, that this is about all of us as we get older. And it's not about those people, those vulnerable people who might need help, but really about how all of us can be, can join together to, um, to help one another. And then for funders, again, that was one of the questions that people had. You know, you you want to be clear um, about the problem that you're you're trying to talk about. Is it a, is it a, about social social isolation? Is it about loneliness? Is social engagement the primary or the secondary aim of the work that you're doing? And again, that kind of clarity can um, can again give you greater clarity on what you're trying to achieve, and hopefully help the the funder understand what it is that you're trying to um, uh, to to achieve with your program. Uh, as well. All right. Now, in terms of tactics and tips, um, the uh, the uh, I want to I want to just take one a few minutes here to kind of let people chat in, uh, if you will, maybe kind of crowdsource a few uh, recruitment tax tactics that have worked for you, and not just for a, a caregiver support program, but for any of your social engagement programs. Folks want to take a second and and do that. I'll I'll kind of read some of those out in the chat. Um, and uh, this, uh, so Lillian Rodriguez notes incentives. Yes, uh, that can be anything from uh, paid incentives or it can be meals, it can be food, et cetera. Um, multi-channel uh, multi -channel, channel approach. Again, I completely agree. One, one size does definitely not, does not fit all and, and trying to find ways to invite peace, people personally. Thank you, Adam. Other ideas for recruitment tactics that work for you? Peer-to-peer -peer presentations, excellent. Uh, there we go. We are uh, community connections. I thought the story about uh, in the last presentation about uh, about engaging the uh, school district and their employee newsletter was really interesting. Um, supporting natural supports to uh, to employment, personal invites, partnerships, spreading the world through different channels. Thank you. Pitches purposeful and meaningful opportunity. So some some great ideas there. Thank you. Um, again, I think you 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 want to think about the recruitment tactics that work, especially for you. What is going to take your message to your audience, making sense of your audience and your environment in the service of your objectives, right? And again, it will likely need to be multi-channel, one one just one email or one um, one approach. Maybe just using some ambassadors. The you know that that will. Um, 
you know, that, that may be helpful to get one or two people, but in order to get you to the objectives, you're going to use multiple things. You want to make sure you're, you're engaging volunteers, word of mouth, social media, media, newsletters, yours and other newsletters, flyers, et cetera. A lot of these uh, questions, a lot of these ideas are in the chat. Uh, community barbecue, I love that. Again, any, anytime you can use food to bring people together is an excellent, uh, is an excellent idea. Um, in terms of sort of, uh, I was also asked to talk a little bit about, um, uh, about uh, tactics and tips uh, beyond the usual suspects. And so you want to ask yourself, well, how am I going to do, how, I, how my, my regular work will get a certain number of people, certain kinds of people, but how do we reach into communities perhaps, or into, into neighborhoods or into groups that we don't have uh, as much connection with? And some ideas here that um, to pay attention to, first of all, that, that if you are trying to recruit into groups that you, you don't have a lot of experience with, or you don't have connections or partners, that, that in fact, it will take more effort and resources, that it will take more than one or single uh, touch, maybe in different, uh, in different ways, whether it's a newsletter or the social media or through an, in, uh, an individual person or a couple of people that need to be um, uh, engaged. Um, the trusted intermediaries um, is really uh, are really important. So if you don't have standing in the community that you're trying to reach, who are the people that do? And can you engage them to be ambassadors? Take K Kathy Hay in here, actually jumped, got ahead of me here about take your word to where they gather. Yes, going to them rather than waiting for them to come to you is really um, is really helpful. Um, making sure that you're if you are working in, in communities that have that uh, speak uh, different languages, that your materials and your programs are translated into those um, uh, uh, into those languages, and 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 making sure that your um, programming is uh, is done during hours when that maybe are not as convenient to you, but that are really convenient to your audience. And so you know maybe you know maybe you have to if you're in, if you're going to be engaging a working population, maybe those those you know your program has to take take place during um, the early evening hours. So. Lots of lots of things to think about in terms of the, the additional effort or resources that you're going to need to uh, reach beyond your usual suspects. And then again, thinking more broadly beyond the aging aging services community, who are the other folks in the community, other networks in the communities that can be helpful? And I note a number of them there, from postal workers to uh, first responders, the healthcare providers we heard in the last, uh, and faith-based leaders, which we heard heard about in the last session. Um, but and, and uh, even small businesses, banks, dry cleaners, restaurants, retail places that again can be helpful to uh, get people to uh, to connect to people that you may not be used to um, uh, connecting with. So that provides. Uh, there, there, so I would uh, continue. Folks, uh, folks are uh, continuing to uh, to chat in. Really great ideas here. Uh, again, these are these are, all of these ideas are really interesting. And again, if you have a, a, a long and, and maybe the list that just comes from this webinar chat, um, you can then ch figure out what your budget looks like, figure out what your audience needs and what your objectives are, and then to really um, you know pick and choose among these tactics because you probably can't do all of them to to prioritize the ones that are are, are you think will be most effective that will again get you to the um, impact that you're really trying to achieve. So I'll take a breath there and, um, and uh, see if there are any additional questions or ideas that, that folks want to, want to ask. There is one question in the, in the, uh, uh, in the, um, in the, in the, the Q&A. Yeah, yeah, I can go ahead and, and share that with you, John. Um, what metrics would you like to, would, would you like to use to measure success? Do you have suggestions for which metrics to use to measure success? Um, and do you have different metrics for funders? Yeah, well, again, I think for the first question, the um, you, you, the metric will will be sort of what your it's sort of your metric, right? So the met, so if for a you know if you're recruiting into a program, it may be the number of people that you're successful at um, uh, uh, engaging or bringing into that program. That's a very concrete, easy easy metric to to pay attention to. If you're building awareness, they can. Um, uh, th that may be that may be a little bit more complicated, but you can look at the number of likes, engagement, any kind of growth in social media, for example, that would that would indicate um, uh, that that your that people are are hearing about, learning about your your work. Any increases in any uh, in the newsletter newsletter open rates or the newsletter click click throughs, for example, 
are, can be very helpful in sort of uh, pointing to the success of your communication uh, efforts. Uh, in terms of different metrics for funders, again, that is a, a more complex question, I guess. It depends on what it is that they are looking for and what they care about. And, uh, and then making sure at the beginning of your program and the beginning of your communications that you are set up to measure those things uh, effectively. We have one more question and that, that I think we will need to, to wrap, but do you have tips or suggestions for what kind of wording to use in various communications that are sensitive to different target groups? Yeah, um, well, yes. Yeah. So the, the, the first thing I would say is that um, um, I would really focus on social connection and the, the, again, the benefits of the, of the work uh, as opposed to social isolation. Um, I don't know, um, you know, I don't know if the, the word social connection, social engagement, those kinds of words are, are that meaningful to people in the community in terms of, of, of convincing them perhaps to join one of your programs. I think it's more important to, uh, again, as, as I described earlier, to focus on the, um, uh, on the benefits as opposed to the, uh, the, the sort of perhaps the, 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 the more technical language around social isolation and social engagement. Um, and then I think there's some very good resources in terms of different, um, in terms of uh, uh, targeted groups. Uh, again, I, I, I will say in my, say for men versus women, um, in a lot of the work that we've, we've looked at, you know, the, some of it matters, some of, it, some of the, the language matters, but also so, the programming matters as well. So in general, the programs that we've tried to recruit for that are kind of group, kind of group-based um, work um, are much more difficult to recruit for for men. And so we focus more on, on the activities and, and what, what they, they are doing as opposed to the social connection aspects of, uh, of that work. Um, and I think there, there are a number of, of, of very helpful tools um, on the uh, Commit to Connect website that, uh, that focus on reaching into different racial and ethnic groups that can be very helpful as well. Super. Um, the components of the smart marketing, um, uh, sorry, the, uh, the for, uh, smart uh, marketing objectives are specific, uh, measurable, uh, attainable, relevant, and time bounded. Thank you. Yeah, that was Sorry another that. question that came up. Well, we are basically at time for, for this segment, but John, thank you so much. That was just a jam-packed session. We really appreciate your, your time with us today. Um, I think that really built off the prior session and allowed us to take that, that deeper dive on um, strategic communication. So thank you. Yeah, I thought um, there were some, I thought there were great ideas in the previous session. And I think yeah. that's, this is a, you know, we always say communications is a group effort. Um, and again, learning from your community, learning from others uh, that are working on this are, are a great way to, um, to, uh, to lift up and amplify ideas that can be adapted in different places. Super. Yeah, and we appreciated your use of the chat. And for anybody who does want the chat transcript, I put our email address in so you can, we can make sure we get it to you that way. But, but thank you. Um, we had an incredible group of amazing leaders, um, both yesterday and today. I want to thank all of our speakers for sharing their time and insights and experiences. And I want to thank the attendees, the hundreds of folks who joined us between yesterday, yesterday and today for joining us as you continue to enhance and expand existing uh, social engagement offerings and perhaps develop new programs. We hope you remain connected with both engaged and commit to connect via um, our various communication channels. So you can access our resources and we can all continue to learn from one another. Um, shortly after this summit, in the next few days, we'll be sending a follow-up email that will contain links to the recordings for both days. That email will also include an evaluation link. And we really do hope you take a moment to complete that survey because your feedback will help to shape our future events and offerings. So keep an eye out for that email. We thank you in advance for providing your feedback so that we can ensure our content does meet your needs. But before this social engagement virtual summit comes to an end, I do want to turn to Katie Clark with the Administration for Community Living to share some final closing remarks. Katie. Thank you, Meredith. And thank you again to the Office of the Surgeon General, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, 
the Administration for Community Living, and U.S. Aging for their leadership and recognizing loneliness and social isolation as critical public health concerns. I also want to thank our incredible speakers and panelists for providing their subject matter expertise and perspectives to us all. We have so much to learn from each other. Um, and thank you all for attending this virtual summit. Your engagement, questions, and commitment to increasing social connection across the U.S. is so inspiring, and it is such a privilege to share this space with you all. I urge you all to build off of the momentum of our time together to work and connect our family, communities, and clients in more meaningful ways. Please continue to engage with ACL, U.S. Aging, through our Commit to Connect initiative and engage to share how it's going, innovation, success stories, questions. Um, we so look forward to continue to work with you all. Um, and thank you again so much.